good afternoon everyone and thanks for joining in today i dr deepika chabra along with my teammate mr amit saxena from medical services jackson pal pharmaceuticals limited welcome you all to the webinar today this webinar is an initiative of lalita memorial hospital rewari in association with rewari obs and gyne society supported by indian fertility society haryana chapter and the academic partner is nari division of jackson pal pharma limited makers of divages endonom ev2 and cystelia m we present to you the range of natural micronized progesterone as divagest endonom ev2 tablets of estradiol valerate 2 mg and cystelia m formulated with the ideal 40 to 1 ratio of myonicitol and dicyroinicitol to restore ovulation and reproductive health in women a warm and hearty welcome to all the esteemed faculty and attendees dear attendees if you have any questions suggestions or clarifications please post those in the text uh, by text in the q and a box also note this webinar uh, will be put up as a recording of this webinar on our youtube channel jackson pal medical insights for reference in future the recording will be shared with you all now we invite dr seema mittal director lalita memorial hospital and infertility center rewari she is also past president rewari of gyne society and currently the treasurer haryana chapter of indian fertility society ma'am kindly initiate the program uh, thank you deepika ji it's indeed my pleasure to have the masters in the field to be with us to share their knowledge and i am sure that after this webinar we will have our own guidelines and uh, reach to some conclusion welcome dr bela it's it's so good to see you our uh, master speaker and all rounder so before we invite the speaker first speaker for the day and i'm really thankful to dr ila that in spite of her bad health and bad throat she agreed to do this and uh, after her presentation i'm sure everybody will be just you know taken aback by the presentation that she makes so may i request our president rewadi of gynae society dr alka yadav to introduce dr ila gupta dr alka is a big support to all of us and she's always always there for all academic sessions over to you dr alka uh, good afternoon everybody and thank you dr seema for inviting me for this session it is really nice to be getting updated on all the fertility uh, problems prevailing these days the patients are really very much agonized by all this stress and so many factors they are coming up late age marriages and all that so we'll be discussing very important things today and uh, i take this opportunity to welcome our first speaker of the day dr ila gupta He is the director and a senior consultant of the Fertility Fertility Clinic at Delhi. So, welcome, Dr. Ila, and please uh, uh, update us with your topic. Thank welcome you, Dr. Dr. Alka and Dr. Seema, for giving this opportunity and for the kind words. So, today's uh, topic is the poor ovarian reserve, and we all know how challenging it is to treat the patients of poor ovarian reserve because everyone wants to have the good success rate ongoing pregnancy rate and very difficult to counsel uh, so as per the s3 consensus on the definition of poor response to ovarian stimulation we all know is the bologna criteria and here at least two of the following three criteria should be met to establish the definition the one is that once maternal age of more than 40 years or any other associated risk factor then the previous poor ovarian response of less than 3 oocytes with a conventional stimulation protocol and an abnormal ovarian reserve test showing afc less than 5 to 7 follicles and the amh less than 0.5 to 1 nanogram per ml so poor responders the 10% of women stimulated by gonadotropin as we have seen in our practice they respond poorly and up to 40% of women are above the age of 35 years so poor response can be in poor ovarian reserve 
and in PCOS patient. Now, this topic is on poor ovarian reserve. But how the poor ovarian reserve is different from the poor ovarian response? Okay, these are two different terminology. We have seen a poor, poor ovarian reserve, poor response. The poor response can be in the PCOS patient also. Poor response can be in the patients who are, uh, they have normal AFC count and normal AMH. So women with PCOS are unlikely to undergo a rapid depletion of their ovarian reserve too early. Hence, the poor responders to ovarian stimulation in PCO women are rarely seen. So what is ovarian reserve? Now, this is a term to describe the functional and reproductive potential of the ovary. It reflects the number and may not reflect the quality of the oocyte. Remember, it does not reflect the quality of the oocyte. It only reflects the number of enteral follicle count. It refers to whatever remains in the declining pool of the primordial follicle. So when we see the patient for the first time on the OPD and screen them for the ovarian reserve, so what is the criteria? What should we look for which tells us what is the ovarian reserve of that particular patient? So first important thing is the age of the patient. We all know as the age advances, the ovarian reserve starts going down. It can be a rapid fall in few patients, may not be that rapidly low in most of the patients. But as the age increases beyond 35 years of the age, there is a statistical fall in the enteral follicle count. Patient with a history of endometriosis, if there is a history of ovarian surgery or the frozen pelvis, Patient having single ovary, if there's a history of smoking, family history of early menopause, PID, genital tuberculosis, any kind of the autoimmune disease which may have the autoimmunity against the ovaries also and may further reduce the count further. The chemotherapy and radiotherapy, it also affects the AMH and the antropolical count. What is ovarian aging? The normal ovarian aging, where the oocyte quality is reduced and the quantity also reduces rapidly after the late 30s. Early ovarian aging is seen in 10% of the women where the reduced oocyte quantity, the quantity reduces faster and then there is a qualitative decline after the age of 32 years of age. So why is prediction of ovarian reserve important in the clinical practice? Because the ovarian reserve is tells us about so many things. How to counsel the patient regarding their reproductive potential. It depends upon the ovarian reserve. Then to plan the better induction protocol. Which protocol we have to take our patients for the treatment. Whether it's IUI protocol or the IVF protocol. For the success and safety of ERT. Again, the ovarian reserve is important. So the predictors, the most common predictors of the ovarian response, clinically, the age, the cause of infertility, BMI, and the genetic history. If you look at the ultrasound, the transvaginal scan on day two or day three of the cycle to look for the number of the enteral follicle and the ovarian volume. Then the hormones, basal FSH, estradiol LH on day two of the cycle, and anti-malarian hormone, which can be done on any day of the cycle. It is not related to day two or day three of the cycle. So what is AMH? It is a member of the transforming growth factor, B family. It is produced in the granulosa cells of the pre and the small enteral follicles of up to 4 millimeter in size. It is a direct marker of the primordial ovarian follicle pool and is almost undetectable at birth. It slightly increases after weeks after the birth and peaks in the late puberty and again becomes undetectable after the menopause. So this is, uh, these are the basic markers as we have just discussed, AMH, AFC, FSH, basal NMN is not done much and the AFC count. So this is the normal follicular genesis. There's a cohort of the primordial follicles forming primary and secondary oocytes. And one of the follicle reaches to the dominance, which is FSH dependent. The other follicles undergo atresia, and the dominant follicle activity it ruptures, releases egg, that is ovulatory cycle. So the ovarian reserve, now based on the AMH value, 
we decide our protocol, we counsel the patient, we plan the further treatment of the patient. So the AMH is less than 0.3 nanogram per ml. We know that patient is going to respond poorly. So the risk we have to explain to the patient of the cycle cancellation, or we may have very few number of eggs on site retrieval, and there may be dilemma of the fertilization status and how it progresses further. And the AMH is 0.3 to 1.2 nanogram per ml. Poor response, we may get two, three follicles here. The AMH 1.2 to 3.5, this patient may respond normally. And when the AMH is more than four, the patient comes into the category of polycystic ovarian syndrome and may, uh, may be a hyper responder when we stimulate these patients with the gonadotropins. What is AFC? It predicts the quantitative aspect of the ovarian reserve. AFC is easy to determine by transvaginal ultrasound, especially on day two or day three of the cycle. It has intercycle variability, has inter-observer inter variability. One doctor is saying you may have, you have three to four enterfollicle count when the patient goes to some other place, may be reported as five to six enterfollicle count or just two to three. So there are, may be inter-observer variability. So less than four to five follicles predicts poor response. And this also correlates with the age and AMH of the patient. So it is not only the intrafollicle count, we have to see the other findings also, the AMH, whether it is corresponding with the AMH of the patient or not. Sometimes you find good AMH, but the intrafollicle count is low. Sometimes you feel the intrafollicle count is good, but the AMH is not corresponding with the AFC. So these are the markers which tells us about the ovarian reserve. AMC and AFC, they are equally productive for the poor response, while the AFC is operator dependent also. Now, age-related decline in the reproductive uh, performance, especially in the old patients and abnormal, and where the endocrinological profile is abnormal. The younger group of the women have so-called occult ovarian failure evidenced by the elevated FSH serum concentration. So you see two categories of the patient. One category where the AMH is low, but the FSH LH normal. You see the other category where the AMH is low, but the FSH LH also starts going high. So where the FSH LH also starts going high. This is a category which is difficult to treat because you may not be sure what quality of egg you're going to get because of the advancing FSH also. Now, younger women with normal hormonal profile has been uh, found to be the most difficult challenges and disappointing issues in the reproductive medicine. So where the younger patients with normal hormonal profile means AMH is low, but uh, the FSH LH they are normal. They are like, they are, I think they are better to respond to the stimulation. And there, even if we get two, three follicles, the quality of the egg, because the FSH LH, they are normal, and the patient is also young. So the genetic changes may not mean much. The fertilization rate will be good, and the chances of conception will also be much better as compared to the other group of the patient. Now, what is positive criteria? Hey, this uh, criteria was uh, used to individualize uh, the group of the patient depending upon the age, enterofollicle count, AMH level. So there are four uh, groups based on the age, enterofollicle count, and the AMH level, the group one, two, and three. Now group, we'll see this group, group one, here the age is less than 35, AFC is more than five, AMH is more than 1.2 nanogram per ml. If you look at the group two, the AFC AMH is the same, but the age is more than 35. Group three, here the age is less than 35, but the AFC and AMH have gone down to less than five and 1.2 nanogram. Group four is where the age is more than 35, but the AFC and AMH is also low, like five and 1.2. Now, if we see the younger group, the group one and the group three, where the age is less uh, than 35. So here the 
possibility of having the genetic abnormality or the genetic changes in the oocytes of the embryo will be less as compared to the group 2 and 4 where the age is more than 35 years of the age. So in group 1 and 3, the low embryo nephroidy risk, whereas in group 2 and 4, the risk may be higher because of the age factor. Now, what are the adjuvants they are uh, used when we take such patients for treatment? And we have very commonly been using these adjuvants like DHEA, use of growth hormone and the use of androgen. So one by one, we'll see these adjuvants. What is the role of these adjuvants, whether they are really effective in improving the ovarian response and, relate, and the pregnancy rate or the ongoing uh, by birth rate. So what is DHEA? It is, uh, the, it was like the first compound which was used at long, many years back now to rejuvenate the ovarian environment and many have been, of us have been still using DHEA and this is the medicine which is given in dose of 75 milligram once a day for three months before the patient goes on to the advanced IVF treatment. So this is uh, Dihydroepiandrosinol, which is most abundant circulating steroid in the human, and it is secreted by the adrenal glands, testes, and the ovaries. Synthesized from cholesterol, it can be converted into other hormones like the estrogen and testosterone, and the level of DHEA declines with age. It's the, Usually, this drug is very well tolerated. I've not seen any side effect of this drug till now. 75 milligram of DHEA is given for at least three to four months, not beyond that. So this is a pro-hormone which improves ovarian uh, response, improves ovarian environment. It augments the insulin growth factor and reduces the apoptosis, means reduces the uh, chances of other follicles atresia. So other follicles which, have, which are seen on the cohort, they also respond to the ovarian stimulation. So what is the benefit of DHEA? Improvement, uh, the ovarian reserve, ovarian environment, oocyte and the embryo quality, increased pregnancy rate and the live birth rate, and it's said to be reduced the nephroidy and the miscarriage rate. But again, there are many studies. The few studies say that it has a beneficial uh, effect. The few studies say still it is the role is insignificant, and uh, we have to have more larger studies and trials to prove that it is really, really effective. So the one uh, like important functional aspect of this drug is how it reduce, how it, it improves ovarian response. It rescues the small enteral follicles from undergoing atresia. So this is the most, one important thing. Whatever number of the enteral follicles we are seeing in, on day two or day three of the cycle, so it rescues those smaller enteral follicles to undergo atresia. So that way the response is better. It also acts by increasing the recruitment of pre enteral or small enteral follicles, which are seen as uh, by the assessed by the anti malarian hormone. So it increases the pre enteral and the enteral small follicles, and it reduces the apoptosis or the atresia of those small enteral follicles. So they also respond to the ovarian stimulation and larges in size and becomes dominant. So the next important is the growth hormone. How the growth hormone, it helps in improving the response. It binds to the, uh, there are receptors. So the growth hormone binds to these receptors on the granulosa, the theca, the luteal cells, promoting the steroidogenesis and the gametogenesis. The growth hormone IGF-1 and growth hormone uh, releasing hormone all increases the sensitivity of ovaries to gonadotropin stimulation and enhance the follicular development and oocyte maturation. It also enhances the aromatase and 3-beta hydrogenase activity, thus increasing the conversion of androgen into estrogens in females. We all know that androgen, how important or how uh, necessary the androgen is to uh, have the good folliculogenesis in the start of the cycle, in the beginning of the cycle. So it helps in conversion of the androgen into estrogen. It directly inhibits the follicular apoptosis in conjunction with gonadotropin and may enhance the follicular 
survival and cell proliferation by strengthening the LH action. So addition of uh, growth hormone to gonadotropin in first few initial days of ovarian stimulation, IVF cycles, it uh, helps to improve the response. So this is the study which says the total number of patients. Now, as per the study, the number of the patients were small in the group. So more RCTs were required to prove this. Uh, as per this uh, study, there was no significant difference was found on the overall implantation rate and the clinical pregnancy rate. The number of the oocytes retrieved were okay, the fertilizer, but on the overall implantation rate and pregnancy rate, there was no significant effect. So this is the Cochrane study, which uh, again says the protocol has uncertain uh, effect on the live birth rate, but it increases the number of the retrieval site in the normal responders. Now, androgens, we, there are many uh, forms of androgens. They are available in the market again. They're in the form of the tablets, in the form of gel. So, and as we know, physiologically also, the androgen is important to improve the follicular genesis, to improve the follicular response. So this influences the responsiveness of ovaries to gonadotropin. Testosterone augments the follicular FSH receptor expression of the granulosa cells, and it promotes the initiation of primordial follicle growth and increases the number of growing preantral and the small antral follicles. But again, there are various studies which says that uh, we need more and more number to prove, to reach to that data that it significantly improves the clinical pregnancy rate. So this is again a Cochrane study which says that pre-treatment with DHEA or testosterone uh, is associated with the improved life. This was done in 2015 with the uh, improved life birth rate. I think I have just got this study only which says that it improves the live birth rate, but the other studies, they still want to have more number of patients to, and the bigger studies to give to, to reach to that data, which says that it improves the live birth rate. Now, there are various types of the protocols which are used for the low responders, whether we should use the conventional protocol, which we are using for the other, other patients, or we should use the agonist protocol, antagonist protocol, the ultra short protocol, flare protocol, minimum stimulation protocol, or the gonadotropins combined with letrose, which is a good drug for the poor responder. So which protocol which should follow to have more number of the uh, oocytes retrieved and better quality eggs and better number of the fertilized embryos. So this is the study which says that agonist antagonist protocol. Now agonist antagonist protocol, the group three and group four patients were stimulated with agonist antagonist protocol. So they have found a better clinical outcome as compared to the conventional antagonist protocol. So this agonist antagonist protocol is a short player protocol where you give the agonist from day one or day two of the cycle for first three days, along with the gonadotropin stimulation. And when the follicle size reaches 13 millimeter, as we do in the conventional protocol, then you start the antagonist. So the advantage is we all know that for initial few days, if we are giving the agonist, it acts as a flare, it increases the FSH. So it improves the response of the gonadotropin. It doesn't suppress the patient for too long because here we are giving only for very short period. And then you can start the antagonist when the follicle size reaches 13, 14 millimeter. So this is agonist antagonist protocol. Now conventional protocol versus the minimal stimulation protocol in patient with poor responders, whether we should start with, uh, depending upon the AMH, like uh, the few studies they say is to start with 375 units or 450 units of gonadotropin, or we should keep our stimulation to minimum. So that is the minimal stimulation protocol because whatever the ovarian reserve is there, what whether we are starting with 225 units, whether we are starting with 300, 375 or 450, 
the responses ultimately it's going to be the same. So the minimum stimulation protocol is preferred as compared to the conventional protocol over uh, high doses of gonadotropins. There is another study uh, which says whether the low dosing of gonadotropin, it is uh, really effective for the poor responders or we should go on with the higher doses of stimulation which gives us a better response. So this is study whether you start with a higher dose or whether you start with the conventional 225 or 300 dose, the response is almost the same, but definitely we are reducing the cost of the gonadotropin to that patient. So it is more cost effective as compared to the high dose gonadotropin stimulation for the responders. Now this is a very in thing now, the intraovarian PRP. So to see the physiology of intraovarian PRP, the use of PRP to improve the ovarian function was initiated by Pantos et al. in 2016 in Greece. So what is the hypothesis or the physiology behind it is the undefined growth factor released from the platelet may induce the transformation of the germline cells into primordial follicles, thus replenishing a diminished follicle reserve. There are so many ev evidences or studies which have gone since then till now, but none of the study or the case report is very convincing. They are all still in the experimental phase. The another theory behind the PRP is when we inject the PRP in the ovaries, it causes the mechanical disruption. And this mechanical disruption, it uh, produces certain mark biochemical markers or certain factors which also improves the follicular environment and is responsible for the follicular activation and follicle uh, development or formation. So this is a study which says that no significant uh, effect of PRP treatment on the ovarian uh, function was observed over one year of follow-up after injecting the PRP into the ovaries. Now, why this is like uh, still we have not reached to one conclusion whether it is effective or not effective. The reasons may be the studies published so far are difficult to compare because of the technical differences in how the PRP was prepared, or there is a difference in the PRP volume injected into the ovaries. The people are taking either 1 ml, 1 1.5 ml, 2 ml injecting on one ovary or two ovaries, then at how many sites the PRP has to be injected? The few studies say eight, nine sites, few studies say 10 to 12 sites then where exactly it has to be injected, into the capsule or into the medullary portion. There are a few studies which have injected the PRP into the capillary, into the capsule or the cortex of the ovaries because here is where the primordial follicles are resting. So that's why uh, because of the so many differences in the technical aspect and in the procedures in the protocol, there is no set protocol when to do the PRP how many weeks or how many days before when we are starting the stimulation or taking the patient actually for uh, IVF should you do the PRP? And is it one PRP enough for these patients for the intraovarian PRP? We say like we go for skin therapy or we go for the hair therapy or for other kind of the therapy for PRP. There are the multiple settings are there. Now, do we expect the response by only one PRP therapy, one PRP intravarian therapy, we want to have the response, the good follicular response, it's still debatable. So the this intravarian PRP is still under experimental thing. We know it more studies, we need more uh, protocols, which gives us better idea to how to exactly use this therapy for ovarian rejuvenation and to have the good ovarian response in poor responders. So if you look at the overall management adjuvants like DHEA, testosterone, growth hormone can be used for these patients because we don't have anything else to do for these patients for the poor responders, so whichever works best. Then for the protocol, ultra short protocol or the agonist protocol and darkness protocol, 
whether we should take them for minimum stimulation, natural, combined with clomiphene, or the aromatase inhibitor, or to suggest them about the intravariant BRP. Now, to tell you the truth, there is no single protocol that can transform the responder into a normal responder or the high responder. The expectations and prognosis should be discussed in detail with the patient, should be counseled thoroughly, and it is preferable to opt for simpler and affordable regime for ovarian stimulation. So it has to be individualized based on the patient history, patient reports, patient how well and mentally the patient is prepared to go for all these things. So the take home message is the counseling is very, very important. And based on the age and the endocrinological profile of the patient, the treatment protocol to be decided. So to individualize it and to look for the option which the patient can easily afford to go for it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ila, for such a super excellent uh, presentation. And uh, just one question before I hand over to Shanar. Are you using uh, growth hormone for your patients? Yeah, I have tried growth hormone. And uh, truly speaking, I'm happy with uh, growth hormone injections. What along is the dose the and how are you using it? I start along with the gonadotropins from the day one of gonadotropin. When we start gonadotropin, the same day start the growth hormone also. And I give four units subcutaneously for first four days and see how many follicles coming up. And once uh, the response is as per the expected, depending upon the AMH and the AFC, then I stop growth hormone and continue with the gonadotropin. So initial for four to five days, I combine gonadotropin with growth hormone. So this is only for poor responders, not yeah. poor responders. No, 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 only for and poor responders. Secondly, and there are two poor responders, young patients. Young, young poor responders. Yeah. yeah. So I second, have not given beyond uh, in the group of patients like who are beyond 38, 39 years of age. Precisely. Yeah. And another is about intra ovarian PRP we are talking because I feel ovary is such a sensitive organ to any growth hormones. So should we not wait for more studies for ovarian malignancies in the patients where PRP has been tried? So are you for it or against it that we will take up later? Uh, I, I am still not comfortable with the idea. In PRP, yes. Idea of PRP, intraovarian PRP especially because I still, I don't know, I can't take it like how one therapy. Only once injecting the PRP into the ovaries, we are going to get the response. Yeah, I know. They're almost silent ovaries. Yes. Yeah. So, over to Dr. So, Shanaz to conclude this session because Dr. Bela is already there with us. So, over thank to you, Shanaz. Madam. Thank you, Madam, for your captivating and insightful presentation on uh, ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve nowadays is a topic uh, in uh, critical topic in reproductive health, especially for the women who are planning to start a family or they are concerned about their fertility. And it, is, it serves as a crucial indicator for the functional reproductive potential of the woman. Your expertise and ability to convey complex information in such an engaging manner is highly appreciated. And we look forward to learn from you in next future also. Thank you very much. And I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shanaz. Thank you, Dr. Seema. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Hila. Thank we would like you to join later on for the panel in case you find some time. I will see, Dr. Seema. I cannot. No. Uh, thank you so much. I can yeah. understand. Thank, thank you for you. sparing your valuable yeah. time. I, uh, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so you. the... Now I invite our next speaker, Dr. Bela, who needs no introduction. Uh, she will be introduced shortly by Dr. Anita Khan. I like her for her versatility. She's a good doctor, a good Foxian, and a good dancer. That's what I like about her. So may I request Dr. Anita Khan to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Bela for the one very important, interesting, and uh, a debatable topic of today. Over to you, Dr. Anita. 
Good, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Bela Bhatt definitely is a very interesting personality and she's the chairperson Foxy Imaging Science Committee of uh, 21 to 25. She is a fetal medicine consultant uh, at Bela's Women's Hospital and Fetal Medicine Center in Andheri, Mumbai. She is a fetal medicine consultant at Do Dr. Baba Sahab Ambedkar Memorial Center, uh, Railway Hospital, Mumbai. She's definitely a very uh, prominent member of uh, Society of Fetal Medicine, Joint Secretary of AFG Mumbai, Managing Council Member, uh, Council member ISPAR. She has received so many prizes and uh, she's the national convener for Foxy Superstar Competition 2019-20. Uh, As uh, Dr. Seema said, she herself is a superstar because she went and fought her own case uh, and won in Bombay High Court against uh, PCPNDT uh, case. So doc, over to Dr. Bela, who will be talking today about the necessity of doing dual and quadruple marker in every pregnancy. So Dr. Bela, please. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairperson, for uh, those kind words of introduction. And at the outset, I'm extremely thankful to Revari Oji Society, IFS Haryana chapter, and Dr. Seema Mittal in particular, who's a very good friend, and uh, for giving me this opportunity to be part of this wonderful uh, uh, webinar. And the first talk uh, by Dr. Ila was really very, very informative. I also enjoyed it. So the topic given to me is dual and quad markers. A must for all, are they a must for all the patients? Well, a dual marker uh, is also known as double marker. So I'll be using the word double marker in my talk. Now, one thing I would like to mention here is that these, both the tests, dual and quad markers have been there to help us to find out the risk assessment of aneuploidies since almost a decade. But unfortunately, it has created more confusion rather than clarity as far as risk calculation for aneuploid is concerned. And uh, uh, hopefully towards the end of this talk, we'll have some clarity on the same. So basically, uh, we all know that double marker comprises of uh, beta HCG and PEPE, which is done in the first trimester between 11 to 14 weeks or when the CRL is between 45 to 84. Whereas quad marker is done in the second trimester between 15 to 21 weeks and it comprises of beta HCG, alpha fetoprotein, unconjugated estrile and inhibin A. Now, these are all screening tests. We know there is a difference between a screening test and a diagnostic test. So basically what is a screening test? So it's like a, a C which will, you know, segregate the high risk population from the low risk population. And at the end of this process, screening test, the result that we get will be some high risk patients which are then offered some diagnostic tests. And then we can reach to a particular chromosomal abnormality, though it is not as simple as it is shown in this slide. And we all have experienced through our so many cases that this is not just so simple. But one thing is for sure to be told to the patient that whatever tests, double and quad marker we are doing are not diagnostic tests and they are just screening tests and will tell us who are the high risk and who are the low risk population. Now, we all know that diagnostic testing is amniocentesis or chorion villus sampling and then subjecting that to further testing like fish or karyotype or microRNA, and reaching to a diagnosis. So, one question could be whether at all to do screening test or go directly for diagnostic testing. But it's very, very logical. We know that whatever small but there is a small risk of abortion with this diagnostic testing with CVS or amniocentesis. And that's the reason first we would like to do some screening tests, try and find out who are high risk population and only subject them or offer them the diagnostic testing or a needle test, which has a small risk of abortion. Now, when we are talking about various hormones in pregnancy or biochemical test, we must have some basic knowledge that the PEPE, beta HCG, PLGF, and inhibin A are placental products because they are produced by placenta, whereas alpha fetoprotein and unconjugated estrile are fetal products because they are produced from fetus. Okay. 
Now, when we are trying to interpret the results either of the dual marker or of the quad marker, this is how we try and interpret. See, in trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, we'll find in double marker that beta HCG is high. What is high? More than 2 MOM. And PEPE is low. What is low? Less than 0.5 MOM. So when you get a combination of high beta HCG and low PEPE, that puts that particular fetus at risk for trisomy 21. Whereas in trisomy 18 and 13, in double marker, we'll find that both beta HCG and PEPE are on lower side. As opposed to this, when we look at the quadruple marker, in that you'll find that in trisomy 21, the fetal products, that is alpha fetoprotein and unconjugated estrel are low. Whereas the placental product, that is beta HCG and inhibin A are high. Why? Because the fetal products are less, the placenta tries to compensate for them and produce high beta HCG and inhibin A. So, very, very essential when we are talking about all these markers and all, we all must know that we should, number one, always look at the MOMs and not the actual value. If you look at the report that you get from the laboratory, you'll find there'll be actual values and then by the side of it, there'll be MOMs, multiple of median. So we must always look at the MOMs and then try and see whether they're fit they fit in any of these combinations because that will tell us, not the lab. We can also make out that there is a higher possibility of which particular trisomy. Now, uh, quadruple marker, uh, there is a bonus because a positive quadruple marker means not just high risk for certain chromosomal problem or genetic problem, but it also gives us uh, about the tells us about the risk of neural tube defects, gastroschisis or omphalocele because in these conditions, the alpha beta protein is going to be on higher side. And it also tells us about certain possibilities of preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, preterm de uh, delivery and IUFD. So these are the additional advantage of quadruple marker. Now, having this basic knowledge and the foundation, now we are going to come to the most controversial part and about which we all have a lot of confusion, whether, first of all, to do or not to do this test, whether double marker or quadruple marker, whether to do or not, whether to do only double marker or only quadruple marker or both. So let's address this question and get clarity on the same. So first of all, we must know and we must always ask this question, why are we doing this test? What is the primary aim? Number one, to find out the possibility of common aneuploidies. That's what it initially started with, right? So we want to try and find out the possibility of common aneuploidies. And for that, we know that there are two things which are important for any screening test. Sensitivity of the test has to be good. And the timing, earlier the better. First trimester rather than second trimester, earlier the better. So our aim is to have a screening test for an employee which has a good sensitivity and which gives us result early in the pregnancy, right? Because those who are high risk, then we'll be offering some diagnostic tests and then we'll get the result that all takes time. And if the baby is found to have some gross chromosomal problem and if the patient opts to terminate, it can uh, safely be done earlier in the pregnancy. Now, when I'm talking about sensitivity of double marker, one thing we have to be very, very clear here is that we never do only double marker. Double marker has to be done in conjunction with nuchal scan. Why? Because only double marker has a sensitivity to pick up common aneuploidies to the tune of 60% only. Yes, the sensitivity is very, very low when it is used only as a single marker. So we never talk about sing, uh, double uh, marker alone. It is always combined with nuchal scan. And when we combine it with nuchal scan, the sensitivity directly jumps to 85 to 90%. Again, condition applies here. The nuchal scan should have been done by a trained sonologist. And it is the responsibility of the obstetrician to look at the images also. Whether 
it has been done in a standard manner, whether the CRL has been done in a standard, the images which I have shown here in the uh, slide, whether the CRL is uh, taken in the standard manner, whether NTNB have been taken in the standard manner and the other markers also like tricuspid and ductus. So unless and until the quality control is extremely important, unless and until even the nuclear scan has been done in a standard way, the risk calculation goes haywire and we cannot take that nuchal uh, scan into account. So for example, if the nuchal scan has not been done in a standard way and you take combine this nuchal scan result with the double marker, then the sensitivity is going to be only 60%. Because if the nuchal scan is not standard, the only double marker sensitivity is 60%. So please see to it that it is done in a standard way. One thing. So never do double marker alone. It is always combined test. Now, if we compare the sensitivity of this double marker, that is combined test and quadruple marker, we can see that the combined test sensitivity to pick up the common aneuploidies is to the tune of 85 to 90%, whereas that of quadruple marker is 75%. The result of the test, obviously double marker gives result early in the first trimester, whereas quadruple marker will give result late, that is in the second trimester. And and as far as additional information is also concerned, to begin with, we were only looking at the aneuploidy risk. But these days, we know that these days gives a lot of extra information. So double marker will also tell us about some risk calculation for fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia, whereas quadruple marker gives us information about neural tube defects and possibility of fetal growth restriction. So we can see here that if you just grossly compare these, a combined test which gives result early with a better sensitivity is a better test as compared to quadruple marker. So that was comparison which is better. Now, whether to do only combined test or both is another question in minds of many clinicians. So I've seen n number of patients where nuchal scan has been done, double marker has been done, it is low risk. When patient reaches second trimester, 16 weeks, again, quadruple marker has been done. Why? So the problem here is we do not ask that question to ourselves. Why am I prescribing this test? Is it going to give me some additional information or it is going to create confusion for both my patient and myself? That is the thing. So as I said, one or both, only either of them and not both. Why? Because if we have done a good combined test, a nuchal scan done in a standard manner, double marker done in a standard lab, then we have done the highest sensitive screening test with the sensitivity of 85 to 90%. So in any screening process, we only step up and don't step down. So once you have done a test with a sensitivity of 85 to 90%, why do you want to offer a test with 75% sensitivity at 16 weeks? You have done your combined test, good sensitivity, low risk. Leave that patient. Explain that this is the number. This is the possibility. You have to live with that number. There cannot be zero risk. This is the number. But we are not going to offer you quadruple marker, which is a lesser sensitivity. It just confuses the patient and the clinician. So if a good standard combined test is done, no need for quadruple marker. Please do not do this second screening test. It will only add to the confusion. Only if the combined test is missed, suppose a patient has come late or patient has not undergone this test, uh, combined test, then yes, you have to offer quadruple marker because at least 75% sensitivity test is there in the second trimester between 15 to 21 weeks. So you can offer quadruple marker. So hope that answers this question. There's only one exception to this rule that both double and quadruple marker should not be done. And what is that exception? Integrated test. Now, again, friends, try and understand. This is also very, very important. Have you ever heard anybody done doing integrated test? If not, why so? Because, again, for a proper integrated test, there are conditions that apply. What is that condition? Number one, both the double and quadruple marker have to be done from the same lab using the same platform reagents and software and this lab should have a software which is able to integrate the results of combined test with quadruple marker and give a single risk at the end what do i mean by that the lab should have a software in which 
as a priori risk, it puts the risk that we have got from the combined test, then adds the quadruple marker as a refining test and gives single risk. Now, remember, in any screening process, at the end of screening test, you should have only one result. You cannot have one risk as per calculation on a combined test and one risk as per calculation of quadruple test. Then the patient will be confused. Ma'am, in that it was low risk. Now, in this, it is high risk. What should I think, whether it is high risk or low risk? That is not the way. And that's why these conditions are very important. Only standard labs, which are FMF accredited lab, have software which can integrate the result of combined test with quadruple marker and give a single result. And what is the end result of that in integrated test? The patient has to be counseled based on that number, whatever it is, one in 500, one in 10,000, whatever. That single risk, the patient tell them, forget about the previous uh, result because now we have integrated that with this quadruple marker. So this is the final risk. And because the integrated risk, the false positive is very, very low, less than 1%. And therefore, it's very, very specific test. So it is good test. But it is not done because majority of time, double marker done some other lab, quad marker done in some other lab. Or even if it is done the same lab, the obstetrician doesn't tell the lab that you have to integrate the result and give me a single risk. Don't give me a quadruple color risk. Right? That is what is important. So this is just for theoretical because we are not using in practice. So in practice, remember, a good combined test is done. No need to do or repeat quadruple marker. Now, somebody may ask, why do you, you know, I, I could see one of the heading of this topic was whether dual and quadruple marker are overburdening our health system. Well, the answer is in negative. No, they are not overburdening our health system. Why? will come to know through few next slides. Number one, it increases the sensitivity. If we take only nuchal scan, it is good, very good. But only nuchal scan has sensitivity of aneuploidy screening to the tune of 80%. When you add double marker to nuchal scan, the sensitivity improves to 85 to 90%. So again, that is one advantage. As we know, the combined test, the double marker, the biochemistry gives us additional information that we have seen in the previous slides about uh, the risk of preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, certain neural tube defect, depending upon the test which is done. And we all have been using the uh, biochemistry with uterine artery PI at nuchal scan, and we can calculate the risk for preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction. And we can start the preventive therapy earlier, low dose aspirin in the dose of 150 milligram, right from 12 to 13 weeks and we can prevent so many of this preeclampsia. So when you are asking this question of overburdening our health system, well, friends, I'm sure many of you must be uh, getting so many cases, especially those who are in the uh, uh, maybe medical colleges or big uh, hospitals, you know uh, that the burden of severe preeclampsia, eclampsia, help syndrome, perinatal uh, morbidity and morbidity associated with this is so, so high. So if you're able to pick up those cases right at your 12 weeks, start a simple medicine like low-dose aspirin, you are either going to delay these complications or make them milder. And we know for sure that in 80 to 90%, we can prevent these complications. So this is magical with such a simple therapy or preventive therapy, we can reduce this burden. So definitely, it is not overburdening our health system. Yes, of course, if you at all feel that I, because of the financial constraint and all patient is not ready for the double marker uh, when you are offering the nuchal scan, then counsel them that these are the options available. And then if patient refuses, please make a note in your clinical papers that patient refuses for the double marker. So at later date, if there is some thing that comes up, you are not blamed. So in that case, tell the patient that you have a test which is having 80% sensitivity. Uh, and if you do not want dual marker, fine for financial reason. But this is what you, uh, is the limitation of it. So now again, based on that knowledge, we'll have, we'll have some discussion of some cases and how to interpret these results actually when you have the report in your head. So as I said, we never look at the double marker. We always look at the combined test result. So how do you look at it and how do you interpret on your own? 
please don't, don't just go to the last page and look at the risk. No, that's not the way you are uh, looking at a combined test result. You have to look at the maternal age, weeks of gestation, uh, antisentize, beta hydrogen, pepe, MOM. And then when you look at the risk, try and see what is it there in the result which is making it high risk, whether it's a baseline age risk, which is high, more than 35 is age, therefore the risk is high, whether it's anti, which is more than 95th centile, whether it's beta HCG, which is high, PEPA, which is low or both low, whatever. So what is making this high? So let's go by case discussion. So here I'm just, first thing I'm just showing you how, what all we look at. So this is the birth date of the patient that will tell you the precisely age of patient. This is the precise gestational age. CRL because it has to be done between 45 and 84. Nuclear translucency, as you can see, it is high here. Then we go and look at the beta HCG MOMs. As I said, we always look at the MOMs. So here the beta HCG MOM is very high. Pepe is low. Uh, and then we come to the uterine artery PI, which is almost okay in this case. And look at the risk. The adjusted risk or the final risk is 1 in 7. So here, as you can see, nuclear translucency is here more than 95th centile. And your beta HCG and PEPE are exactly fitting into the Down syndrome. Beta HCG more than 2 mom, PEPE 0.5 mom. That's the reason. Both the nuclear scan and biochemistry have been high risk. And that is the reason. So when you come to look at this, you should have clarity in your mind as to what all has made high risk in this particular patient. So obviously you will be offering uh, CVS or amniocentesis in this patient and uh, try and find out whether the baby is having trisomy 24 or not. So when you look at the MOMs of both PEPE and beta HCG, in this particular case, the PEPE was low, right? So whenever there's low PEPE, we know that the combination of high beta HCG and PEPE makes a uh, high risk for aneuploidy, but it also tells you about many other things. So you must look at the uterine atrial Doppler because a low PEPE also increases the risk for fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia. So whether the uterine atrial, uh, PI is mean PI is high, when you look at the beta HCG MOM, if there are more than two, first check few things. Whether HCG injection has been given in a week. You cannot do beta HCG if the patient has been given in many, many IVF conceptions, the patient is on beta HCG injection. So last one week, beta HCG shouldn't have been given. Sample collection and transport. If the, uh, the cold chain has not been maintained, then uh, you know the because of high temperature, there can be hemolysis, which can increase the beta HCG value. And apart from these technical things, Placental pathology like partial molar, uh, pregnancy, diandric, uh, triploidy, where the beta HCG is going to be very, very high. Turner syndrome, it's going to be very high. And if all these are ruled out, even we have to watch for fetal growth restriction in cases where there is high beta HCG. So apart from just aneuploidy, it gives a lot more information to us. Not only this, when we are interpreting the results of biochemistry, the lab where we send the uh, biochemistry has to be standard. What do you mean by standard? It should ask for all this from you in the form that you fill up. The age, the ethnicity, race, gestational weeks, weight, singleton or multiple diabetes, uh, no smoker, IVF, because the lab has to adjust uh, the risk as per all these factors. So if the lab doesn't ask you about all these things, Put that lab aside. Please do not send uh, your samples to those labs because these are required to be adjusted. And I'll show you through the cases how it affects. Now, why a uh, standard lab and machine is required? Because all these results are affected by machine and reagents used. And FMF accredited labs audit their data every year. And new MOMs are generated every year which are used in calculation and therefore the authenticity of the report is highest. So you must, must check for that. Now look at this case. This 26 years old female with insulin dependent diabetes mellitus was sent to me for coronavirus sampling at 12 weeks, two days. Why? Because her, uh, this, as you can see, the risk of trisomy 21 was one in 24. Now look at this. The report that the patient was carrying was showing that the PAPE MOMs are so low, 0.16. It's very, very low. And even the beta HCG MOMs are low. And that's the reason why trisomy 18 
risk is so high one in 24 and therefore she was sent for CVS. Now, but when I look at the history part, which is to be filled in the form, it was mentioned insulin dependent diabetes, no. Whereas actually patient was insulin dependent diabetes. So what I mentioned is when you are filling up form, you have to be extremely careful. The patient is insulin dependent. You have to mention that it is because lab will correct the markers. And this is the paper which showed from the King's College that in insulin dependent diabetes, the PEPE is generally reduced and therefore lab has to do correction for this PEPE in this insulin dependent diabetics. So in this particular patient also, when I put that uh, uh, history of diabetes mellitus in my software of uh, extra software that uh, patient is having insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, look at the risk. It has improved so much from 1 in 24 to 1 in 284. Now it is in almost intermediate risk. So that's the importance of history also. So remember each small thing is important. Your history taking, your uh, form filling, you're looking at each and every parameter. Everything matters in risk calculation. So learning point here is that you have to fill up the forms also very properly if you want an authentic risk calculation based on this tests right now this is another case uh, where the double marker was already done which was showing high risk for trisomy 18 and 13 was referred for nuchal scan first the double marker was done and what look at these markers again pape is so so low 0.04 mom beta is 0.4 so low obviously risk for trisomy 18 13 is going to become high but when I did, ultra, uh, so this came as more than 1 in 50. It was positive for trisomy 13, 18. But when I did ultrasound, there was IUFD. So obviously when there is fetal device, all the hormones are going to fall. So what do we learn from this? Let your nuchal scan be primary screening test. First do a nuchal scan that will check for the viability also and we, uh, so many other marker uh, things that we look at in the um, uh, not just markers for aneuploidy structure anomaly and preeclampsia risk and everything we look at in the nuchal scan. So first always do a nuchal scan and then only send patients for double marker. So that was how to read a test. Now, uh, uh, just some additional information that we get from all these biochemical tests. So as I said, all these beta IgG, PAPA, alpha fetoprotein, unconjugated estradiol, inhibine, PLGF, Apart from risk calculation, it gives a lot of extra information. And what is that? Tells about some of the genetic syndromes, neural tube defects, placental dysfunction, and therefore the risk for preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, stillbirth, possibility of placenta accreta spectrum, which is increasing these days like anything, accidental hemorrhage, and preterm delivery also. Right? All these things are important and bio biochemical markers add this information. And there is significant overlap between markers of aneuploidy and markers of poor placental function. So we have to be wise to differentiate between two of them. So let's have a look at what are the markers of placental insufficiency or poor obstetric outcome. So in first trimester, if we look at beta HCG, if they are, the MOM is more than three, PEPE if MOM is less than 0.4, PLGF at all, if at all it is done, less than 0.5 mom. Alpha fetoprotein, more than 2 mom. All this tells that there is problem with the placenta. And it can lead to many obstetric complications. Higher chance of fetal growth restriction, preeclampsia, placental abrasion, APH, and what not. So look at this case. Now this patient had his, was diabetic, chronic hypertensive. We have checked for all the things which are important. Look at the nuchal translucency, somewhere around 58 centile. Here, but look at the, the PEPE. PEPE is at 0.3 mom, quite low. Look at the uterine artery PI, 2.78. It is 1.6 mom, much, much higher than 95th centile. And therefore, look at the risk for preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction. So very high, more than one in four is the chance of preeclampsia. So when I read the report this way, I know the reasons why the risk for preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction has come high. The biochemistry is very, very low and the uterine atrophy is very high. So very, very simple. So here the 
risk of trisomy 21 has also come high because beta HCG is tightly on higher side, PEPA is on lower side. But I know that mainly it is the placental pathology. So when I'm counseling the patient, of course, we have to offer, we always offer the patient's uh, diagnostic tests to rule out trisomies, but then we have to keep an eye on all these complications. And when I know that this patient has such high risk and I counsel the patient, I know if anything untoward. So number one, I'll always start low dose aspirin in this patient in the dose of 150 milligram at night, right from 12 weeks till 36 weeks. And I know for sure that I'm going to reduce the chances of this preeclampsia in this particular patient, or at least it will make it milder and delay it. Number two, I have counseled the patient very well right at three months of pregnancy that, look, you have a high chance of developing preeclampsia. Look, your baby can have fetal growth restriction. So if at all any such things happens at fifth, sixth, eight, seventh, eight months, patients are mentally prepared for monitoring, treatment, and parental outcome. So, so you suddenly don't get such things on face at six or seven months. You know how well to monitor, closely monitor this patient. So a lot of benefits of doing this combined test and biochemistry. When you are doing quadruple marker, the unconjugated Israel is a part of it. And now this, apart from giving information about trisomy 21 and 18, if a very, very low level of estradiol, that is less than 0.15 MOM, is associated with certain genetic syndromes like smith lemley opitz syndrome, X-linked ichthyosis, placental sulfatase deficiency syndrome, aromatase de deficiency syndrome, and primary or secondary fetal adrenal insufficiency. And friends, these are not very uncommon as we thought before. Nowadays, with better and better uh, skill uh, in ultrasound and better better genetic understanding and genetic tests available, we do find this test. And therefore, a very, very low estradiol, you, you always must do a genetic counseling with the geneticist and patient should be offered some of the tests which are necessary. Again, as I said, this biochemical test give us a lot more information than aneuploidy. What is the role in placenta accreta spectrum prediction? Well, in second and third trimester placenta previa, unexplained elevated level of maternal alpha fetoprotein can be associated with placenta accreta, increta, percreta. Now, we all must have encountered and we know how dreaded the complication of the morbidly adherent or placenta accreta, increta spectrum. We get bad PPH and the worst of the complication and sometimes even maternal mortality with this. And how important it is to predict, counsel the patient and plan the delivery in a tertiary center where multidisciplinary uh, support is there, blood bank is available, patient is prepared. Everything is there where you can save the life of mother. So this marker, when you find that they are uh, there along with your placenta previa, then it ra raises the suspicion. And of course, you can monitor then with ultrasound and MRI and uh, closely monitor and predict and plan the pregnancy of these patients. So I hope it is very, very clear that these biochemical tests are not, not just for the aneuploidy, but will give us a lot more information. So yes, I am always all for this, except for when there is financial constraint, I explain the patient and make a note in my clinical uh, notes. Well, I am happy that the topic was whether dual or quad and nobody uttered anything about triple marker because we all know triple marker is obsolete for a very obvious reason. The sensitivity is 65%, which is very, very low. No screening test with less than 75% sensitivity should be done. And therefore, please throw it in the dustbin. Still rarely we get some reports of triple marker. Please throw it in the dustbin. We have better tests available. Do not do a triple marker. And well, when we are talking about any screening test, remember pre-test, and post-test post -test counseling is extremely, extremely important. We do not have time for this. Well, friends, you must have either on your own, you should be able to counsel, or have a staff of yours who is able to counsel this to the patient because look, patients have lots of wrong impression. After doing this test, it's low risk, so my baby is fine. No, a lot more information that the patient has, should be getting. Choose the right screening test at right time. Know the sensitivity of each test, then you'll be offered the proper test. 
counseling is important no risk doesn't mean no risk even if the risk is one in 10000 that one down syndrome is still sitting in that 10000 so at the end of pregnancy the down baby down syndrome baby is delivered patient will ask apne the bola the test is low risk baby is fine those words should not be used always counsel the patient it is low risk but there is nothing like no risk because this is a screening test we have not taken the baby's blood or amniotic fluid to test this is not a diagnostic test. This is a screening test. High risk doesn't mean presence of disorder. When you say one in 200, high risk, patient will go and know about. No, one in 200 means 199 babies are still normal. Only one baby is affected. Counsel numbers and don't tell it is high risk. Say high possibility, but not risk. So these are finer things which are very, very important. in Counseling has to be there pre-test, post-test, and then only the patient uh, you can count, uh, make them understand better. Document what you offer. As I said, the patient refuses any. Patient doesn't want double market. Patient doesn't want nucleus, can nothing. Mention it on your paper. So you are clear that I have offered, but the patient refuses. That's fine. The patient doesn't want any screen test, up to them. It's our duty to give them the information that this is the best for you. Um, ultimately, it is patient's wish. And as I said, keep the option of no screening open. But I think nuclear scan is something which gives much more information about structural anomaly also. And third month scan, I think every patient is now ready for third month nuclear scan and the fifth month anomaly scan. So these two scans are very, very important and we should always counsel about that. I think, uh, hope I have uh, tried to clear uh, the confusions related to this topic. Uh, thank you so much for patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bela, for such a brilliant and evidence-based presentation was by the super soft iron lady. So <laughs> I'm sure all the attendees are enthralled with this uh, extremely wonderful presentation. And uh, before I hand over to Deepa, I would like to introduce Dr. Anita Khan, the chairperson for this session. Maybe have the slide of Dr. Anita, Deepika ji. So... Uh, Dr. Anita is Chairman and HOD Department of OBGY, Asian Institute of Medical Science, Faridabad, and uh, academician as well, she is. And uh, she's past president, Faridabad Minapur Society, patron, Faridabad OBGY Society, and she's DNB teacher since 2004, and has got multiple publications in international journals. It was a pleasure to have you here with us, Dr. Anita. And now over to Dr. Can I, can I say a line? Yeah. Dr. Bela, uh, as an obstetrician, I'd like to say that these doubts are so pertinent, which you have cleared now, because uh, people do get the test done or they don't get the test done and they don't know how to interpret. So thank you so much. Yeah, you fully justified the topic, Dr. Bela. I'm so happy. Yes. And we are looking forward to that series which we had planned, you know, till now, like beginning is half done now. So over to Dr. Deepa. Excellent presentation, Dr. Vela. As everybody has said, it was superb and very crystal clear things to all the audience and yes, definitely to us also. And uh, the thing is, before we prescribe a test or we suggest a test, we should know about the test. That's the, uh, about the test we are suggesting to the patient. That is very, very important. And uh, one point is we should know the indication why we are uh, suggesting this test. Secondly, when is to be done? That is very, very important because we should know very clearly. Again, the combined test is very important. Simple dual marker has very, very low sensitivity and there's no point suggesting that. Then the third is interpretation of the test because whatever the report the person has written, but we have to suggest we should know how to interpret the test and the most important part is the counseling of the patient. We should know whatever the interpretation of the test is there. We should be able to tell our patient why this thing is positive, why thing is negative. And yes, definitely it's a screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. So we are yes suggesting it is very, very sensitive test. And yes, uh, you have got a very low incidence of this particular uh, congenitor or any uh, defect. But yes, we cannot assure you. And as per my thing, I always suggest my patient for a dual marker and an NTNB scan. And yes, it is up to the patient whether they want to go for it or not. And it's very important to document on our prescription. Thank you, Dr. Bela. And th thank you, Dr. Seema, for including me in the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Deepa. So we have now the next topic for today because uh, 
whenever we come across uh, IVF failure, we just keep on thinking what is the best we can do. So hope we reach to a consensus and I would invite Dr. Nandini Jain to introduce the next speaker. Good evening, everyone. It is indeed my pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Seema Mittal, ma'am, for our next session. Ma'am, as we all know, is an extremely talented, inspiring and motivating person. She's a great clinician indeed. Ma'am is a senior consultant of Zingaini Rivadi. Ma'am is pre past president of the Rivadi of Zingaini Society. She is a director of Lalita Memorial Hospital and IVF Center. And she is an all-rounder. She is an awardee from the president and government of Haryana for the local champion yeah. award. Now, ma'am uh, will give a talk on poor endometrium latest treatment modalities. And uh, over to you, ma'am. So healing the poor endometrium is my topic for today. As we all know that ability of endometrium to allow normal implantation is termed deceptivity. And whenever you come across a patient where IVF failure is happening and you want to look at both the aspects, the embryo and the endometrium. So that's why we took the topics today. Dr. Ila talked about poor ovulation and we are talking about the poor endometrium. And I hope after this webinar, we reach to some consensus and it helps all our youngsters who are attending this webinar today. So as we all know, it's like soil and the seed theory. So embryo implantation depends on the opposition, adhesion, and invasion by the blast when it is entering the endometrial cavity. So once the blast enters, it undergoes opposition, adhesion, and ultimately invasion. Interruption at any of the steps leads to poor receptivity and IVF failure. So there can be range of receptivity problems. There can be complete implantation failure, or there can be Severe deficient implantation where we have miscarriages or the chemical pregnancies and patient wants an explanation why it happened. So causes of defective receptivity can be many. It could be endocrinal, inflammatory. It could be septa, polypoid or immunological mediated disturbances or the vaginal flora is not good. So what is endometrial thickness? A thin endometrial is probably the morphological expression of defective vascularization it's all about the vascularity of the endometrium during the invasive phase. Minimum endometrial thickness required to attain implantation remains undefined today also if we go with literature. So IVF success rate, I am really excited to look at the big holdings claiming success of IVF. 85% we have Dr. Vela, Dr. Dipankar will be joining us soon. So we will be discussing, are we really getting 85% success? Or is it just a beautiful uh, publicity gimmick that shows the 85%? Because I feel in the best hands also, we have up to 50% success rate today. So if there is good embryo, there is good endometrium, we will have implantation. Receptive endometrium requires estrogen priming, which is needed for endometrial proliferation and development of progesterone receptors. Progesterone receptors are also very, very important for good endometrium. So time-related progesterone induced secretory changes in the endometrium. Other molecules like IGBF, PP1, prolactin, laminin, integrin, catheterin, LIF, all are needed for receptive endometrium. Causes of thin endometrium, we all know very well. It could be Asherman syndrome or most common with us is clomiphene, citrate, prolonged use or endometritis. Any infection, septic abortion, chemotherapy, hypothalamic hypogonadism, fibroids, bullerian anomalies, again, very common with IV patients, premature ovarian insufficiency, as we already talked, hyperandrogenemia, hydrogenic, and idiopathic. How do we measure endometrial receptivity? The method should be sensitive, specific, accurate, non-invasive, cheap, acceptable to our patient, and easily available. So, we are yet to find, but when we combine all our modalities, we do get to know about the endometrial status. So first step for anybody treating an infertile patient would be to find out the cause. So uterine cavity assessment by the hysteroscopy or sonohistogram may be performed. With us, hysteroscopy remains the mainstay for assessing the uterine cavity as well as the endometrium. And uterine assessment will identify some patients who can just be corrected by simple surgical management, say a polyp or there is a septal defect. 
most studies have not identified endometritis as a contributing factor, but if treated, it gives very, very good results. And we have to rule out endometritis before taking up our patient for IVF. No studies on the treatment are yet available. So in chronic endometritis, we can look for three or more plasma cells per section which are detected by immunohistochemistry. We can be a little more sophisticated in our histopath and staining for CD138 can be done. Lower amount of endometrial lactobacilli in patients with chronic endometritis compared with women without chronic endometritis. Hysteroscopy is very, very important, very helpful. And some basic problems like additions that we come across during hysteroscopy, they can be treated and diagnosed at the same time, small polyps, or we can look at other areas of infection or endometritis and treat them. Then uterine microbiota also contribute to healthy endometrium physiology. Whenever we are coming across ART failure, we have done hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy and uh, ultrasound we will be talking about. So either we find a receptive endometrium and we go ahead with the treatment or if it is non-receptive, then we go for other tests. So hysteroscopy, ultrasound and ARA test for window of implantation are major tests which are done for endometrial receptivity. Analysis of endometrial biopsies or endometrial fluid have been used to characterize the molecular expression signature of endometrial receptivity. It helps to predict when the uterus is more receptive to the embryo, thereby defining the appropriate time for transfer. Till date, we were doing that one size fits all. We have to start progesterone and either it is a day three transfer or day five transfer. And that's done for all patients. But now we have realized that sometimes the endometrium is not prepared and ARA test justifies the time, whether it is before or over time when we have to transfer the embryo. And studies have shown that it does improve results. So accelerated or delayed endometrial luteal phase differentiation or abnormal results in endometrial receptivity test tell us the shift in timing of frozen embryo transfer. Then most important test which is done by all of us is endometrial thickness by ultrasound. Endometrial thickness is directly correlated to increasing circulating estrogen. Endometrial thickness, it's related to endometrial receptivity and can be a predictor of success in assisted reproduction. In 10% cases, the ideal image for measurement is difficult to obtain due to presence of fibrides, polyps or surgeries. But ultrasound benefits outweigh all other clinical modalities for testing endometrial thickness. Another important aspect of ultrasound, which has been not talked much about, is the junctional zone uterine receptivity. What is junctional zone? Junctional zone is a hormone-dependent zone which is located between the endometrium and myometrium, passing through cyclical changes in its thickness. So, Pregnancy outcome will depend on the sperm and oocyte quality, uterine junction zone, and the technique of embryo transfer. There have been studies that uh, junctional changes throughout the stimulation cycle and growth is different in pregnant and non-pregnant groups. The sensitivity of junctional zone may be associated with implantation success. And junctional zone thickness measured at fundus, right, left, and average show increase during the stimulation cycle. Average rate of growth is 0.16 plus in the pregnant group and it is significantly thinner in pregnant group than in the uh, non-pregnant group. This is how we measure the junctional zone thickness. So this is besides the endometrial thickness and uh, this is how it goes on increasing gradually in IVF cycles. This is another diagram. So an endometrial thickness of what is the ideal thickness uh, we will be discussing uh, soon in our Panel discussion, what is an ideal thickness? I will say that it is 6 mm. Somebody will say it is uh, 8 mm. But an ideal thickness for endometrium is 9 to 14 millimeter. More than 14 millimeter, again, is problematic, especially in cases like adenomyosis. The endometrial thickness goes beyond 14 mm. And when your endometrial thickness is going beyond 14 mm, chances are that that will be a failure. So 9 mm is ideal. Less than 6 is taken as the cutoff for poor results. So what is a thin endometrium? Controversy remains. 
clinical what is the impact of thin endometrial lining on fresh and frozen embryos clinical pregnancy and live birth rate decrease for each millimeter of endometrial thickness below 8 millimeter in fresh ivf cycles and below 7 millimeter for frozen thaw cycles how does it affect implantation obviously there will be poor growth of glandular tissue decrease vgf expression poor vascular development high resistance in radial arteries and vascular endothelial growth factor will decrease blood flow thin endometrium so the likelihood of achieving an endometrial thickness decreases with age and viable pregnancy rate remains reasonably acceptable in patients with endometrial thickness between 4 and 6 mm there is just one single study which has mentioned that pregnancy happened with 4 millimeter uh, Endometrium, in uh, our 25 years experience of uh, IVF setup, I have yet to find a patient where pregnancies happen in 4 millimeter. Uh, it's a topic for debate for our future discussion. So, in ovarian stimulation treatment, there is insufficient evidence to recommend changing stimulation protocol like we were talking in poor ovarian failure, that changing a protocol, adding a growth hormone, or agonist antagonist protocol does help in improving the egg quality, but in endometrium, there is no quality of evidence. When should we add estrogen? As we all know that estrogen does improve endometrium. It uh, gives good results also in uh, IVF cycles and with poor endometrium, we are as a policy adding estrogen for all patients. So when should we add? Here the study says that addition of luteal Estrogen supplementation in stimulative cycles improves the pregnancy rates and improves IVF embryo transfer rates. This is not very convincing. So there's another study which says that uh, uh, we suggest against the use of luteal estradiol to improve pregnancy rates. And with our experience also, we do not recommend adding estradiol in the luteal phase of cycle. This is again a question for discussion. So there was no evidence of difference between the group where the progesterone was added or progesterone alone was given or progesterone estrogen were added in the luteal phase support. Educate progesterone is very, very important. Here is, we can see that uh, on day 10, the progesterone is 6.6 .6 nanogram and day 25, 9.2. Raise progesterone during, if we find that during day of uh, transfer, progesterone level is high, we should not be transferring. Or day two, if we find progesterone level is more than recommended, we should not be doing transfer in that particular cycle. Estrogen in agonist cycle, uh, this is another study which says that significantly high implantation rate and pregnancy rate were found in patients who received low doses of estrogen compared with no estrogen. And they have recommended 6 milligram estrogen supplementation for best results. Estradiol supplementation is beneficial for improving live birth rates in cycles with estradiol level not level less than 5,000 picomole, but not recommended in cycle above 10,000. This is another study which has used the effects of estradiol for luteal phase support in fresh embryo cycle. So, this is now proved beyond doubt that estrogen does help in improving not only the endometrium, but also the implantation rate and the pregnancy rate. So are there any other treatment modalities available? There are a whole lot of adjuvants and uh, we all must be prescribing in different forms. Evidence is not supporting it, though there are studies, but they are very small studies and um, the results are very variable. So in ovarian stimulation treatment cycle, there is insufficient evidence to recommend the use of adjuvants to improve endometrial thickness or pregnancy rates. Here is an A1 study where patients with thin endometrium in ART undergoing endometrial preparation and uh, they found insufficient evidence that any specific protocol for endometrial preparation provides better pregnancy outcome. Uh, this is how it has been recommended that estrogen can be, should be started ideally on day 2. It's uh, 4 mg per day which can be increased to 8 mg. That's what we do. We start with a smaller dose. We do a day 5 scan, day 8 scan, and if we find that patient is responding, but endometrium is poor, we go up to 12 milligram, and the TVS is done. And if endometrium falls within 7, 9, or 10, then the dose is adjusted and progesterone is started, and the transfer is done on day 3 or day 5. 
how long estrogen should be continued this is again a topic of uh, discussion which we will be coming subsequently in our panel discussion so its endometrial receptivity is tolerant to a wide duration of estrogen treatment uterine preparation consists of 6 mg can be extended to as long as 5 weeks but again there are contradiction to this study and uh, longer the duration of estrogen support to get a good endometrium poorer are the pregnancy rates so, though the long duration of E2 therapy is not deleterious, but the results are not good. Decreasing the length of E2 therapy is beneficial in terms of cost and time to pregnancy. So, in this study, 23 patients proceeded with a fresh embryo transfer and one patient conceived. So, 13 patients underwent a frozen embryo with hormonal replacement where estradiol was continued until endometrial thickness reached 8 mm. So, range was 14 to 82 days. In our practice, we don't uh, give estrogen beyond 22 days. And uh, if patient is not responding in that uh, particular cycle, we stop. Because uh, there are many studies which have reported uh, long-term consequences of prolonged estrogen. And uh, endometrial carcinoma is one of the complications. So, these are another again studies where prolonged estrogen exposure as part of artificial endometrial preparation significantly decreases the live birth rate after autologous frozen flower blastocyst transfer. And another study by fertility sterility says that duration of estrogen administration that is uh, between 10 to 36 days before frozen embryo did not impact implantation. So maybe 36 days can be taken as the cutoff. Variation in the duration of estradiol supplementation before progesterone initiation does not impact frozen embryo transfer. Uses of adjuvant, not going into much detail, sidnophil, aspirin, arginine, with vitamin E, pantoxifylin, GCSF, and we will talk a little bit about platelet-rich plasma. So, sidnophil, uh, very few studies, and in our experience, sidnophil does improve endometrial thickness, but does not help anywhere in pregnancy rates. So, these are some studies, but not much in support. Pantoxifylin is, again, 400 mg per day can be given, but no control studies are done, though there are several case series. Similar is for aspirin, and then again, tocopherol and L-arginine, and uh, these are very small studies and very poorly controlled. GCSF is one molecule which has been used widely. It can be given uh, systemically, or it can be used in intrauterine cavity also uh, studies have varied opinion some say increase in pregnancy rate which is not statistically significant in our personal experience gcsf does not have any role in improving the endometrium this will again be taken up in discussion electropuncture so platelet rich plasma is uh, one molecule where we are working on it and i find it uh, to have a promising future and I would like to share with my audience. So it is described in patients with thin endometrium resulting from Asherman syndrome, not only Asherman syndrome, but wherever you feel that uh, you've done two cycles uh, follow up with the patient and the endometrium is persistently poor and then you put uh, PRP, it's just like how you do IUI and subsequent cycles, you can really see that endometrium is growing so well. So preliminary studies, we have to do more studies, more research, and uh, people who are in medical college can definitely give this research topic to their PG students. So preliminary studies are promising for a population which has a poor prognosis and few options for treatment, and further research and control studies are required. So how is PRP done? 0.5 ml to 1 ml of prepared PRP sample is loaded. We have a blood bank, so we know how it is done. We give 1200 rotation for 12 minutes, and then 3300 rotation for five minutes and that's how we take the platelets aggregate and it is infused into the endometrial cavity by an IUI cannula and uh, it's better to do it under ultrasound guidance because that improves our results and uh, it's, again we have to say take same precautions that we are not over pushing we are not pushing air and it is we are not pushing too far into the fallopian tubes so next Uh, next and uh, most important topic and which has been uh, there's been lots of uh, case presentation and research is uh, management of histoscope management of poor endometrium by histoscopic installation of platelet rich plasma 
and in patients whose embryo transfer have been uh, cancelled due to thin endometrium, PRP guided by hysteroscopy has been injected at the endomyometrial junction. And this will serve as an approach for management of this patient. How we talked about PRP in ovarian um, ovaries, I think uh, uterine PRP has definitely important role and uh, it is free from side effects also. And here we present a study where 32 patients aged between 27 and 39 years suffering from primary or secondary infertility was selected for hysteroscopic installation of PRP. This cross-sectional study included a retrospective assessment of endometrial cavity on the commencement of progesterone treatment after hysteroscopy guided injection of PRP into the sub-endometrial zone. After PRP installation, the endometrium was 7 mm or thicker in 24 patients. All 24 patients underwent embryo transfer and 12 out of 24 patients had clinical pregnancy with visualization of cardiac activity at six weeks. So here they recommend that improvement in endometrial thickness and high pregnancy rate with PRP in endometrium. Stem cell, again, some of our colleagues in India also have started doing stem cell and definitely I'm sure everybody must have come across the patients who have persistently calcified endometrium. All modalities fail. Patient is not able to afford a surrogate and you just keep on wondering what to give her. So stem cell definitely has a future, but it is invasive and very, very expensive. Because we know endometrium is dynamic, cyclically regenerating tissue and a unique model of physiological angiogenesis in adults. Here, Bone marrow stem cells are taken and they contribute to the regeneration of the endometrium. On the basis of these facts, adult autologous bone marrow stem cells were used for regeneration of damaged endometrium. And early studies are proving very, very fruitful, but we have to wait for more studies. HCG GRH agonists, as we already talked, they do not really help. Scratching of endometrium has been tried, was tried in past, but doesn't help much. So, Canadian there is a Canadian study and they are all against use of any of the uh, patient going under uh, embryo transfer cycle, the aspirin, sildenafil, and any of the molecules are not of much help in improving endometrium. But platelet-rich plasma and stem cell do have a future and we need more studies to work on the improving pregnancy rates. In non-IVF patients, especially those who are taking clomiphene citrate and there is a poor endometrium, the studies have shown that addition of 6 mg estradiol well rate following CC treatment can prevent endometrial thickening without perturbing folliculogenesis and ovulation. So, ovulation induction with CC might result in lower EMT than uh, ovulation, other ovulation induction regimes. So, in case you find that endometrial thickness is low in PCOD patient, estrogen can be added. Though the endometrium will improve, but in such patients, pregnancy rates have been reported as low. So, in the end, uh, we would like to conclude that whenever you come across a patient with poor endometrium, we have to first diagnose the condition. That can be by ultrasound, hysteroscopy, ERA, not much in use nowadays, and uh, other supporting evidences, and treat the cause if it is possible, support with estrogen or PRP or the stem cell therapy. All we need are large, well-designed, randomized trials to be conducted to evaluate the effectiveness and safety of all these interventions. Thank you so much. And all the questions and queries now we will be taking up in our panel discussion where we have uh, the most learned faculty with us. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful deliberation, ma'am. Indeed, an enlightening session for all of us. Ma'am gave us useful insights into the latest treatment modalities in the patients who have poor endometrium. Ma'am very beautifully explained about the practical aspects that are associated with patients of chronically thin endometrium. And lately, there has been an increased interest uh, in PRP and its hysteroscopic installation. And this actually appears to be a very promising tool. And of late, there has been an increased interest in the stem cell therapy, which is coming up. 
So let's see how the future unravels. And thank you so much, ma'am, for inviting me as a, a chairperson for this session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nandi. And now we, I think we start with our panel discussion where we have our most uh, learned faculty and the stalwarts in the field of infertility. May I invite Dr. Akriti? Uh, good evening, everyone. Now we'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, Dr. Dipankar, Director, Ideal Fertility Center, Jabalpur, teacher and our mentor with special interest in reproductive endocrinology and fetal medicine since 30 years. Dr. Menakshi, Reproductive Medicine Specialist and Senior Consultant at ART Clinic and Senior Consultant at ART Clinic, trained in advanced reproductive techniques and has been performing independently for over the past 13 years. Dr. Sonu Balhara, Director, ART Fertility Clinic contributed to many research papers and associated to many uh, associated with various charitable programs and NGOs in NCR. And Dr. Garima Singh, Senior Consultant IVF at Baby Joy Fertility, has innumerable publications to her credit and has been actively involved in workshops. Thank you, Dr. Akriti. Meanwhile, you can take the uh, just find out the question from the audience, which we'll be taking up in the end. Dual and quad markers, do you recommend it to you, all your patients or do you, this is not? After Dr. Bela's talk, I don't think anybody requires uh, me to answer this question, but uh, still I do not recommend uh, both the tests for all my patients. So as a screening test, I usually use uh, the dual marker and the NT scan at 11 to 13 weeks. And uh, if only there is some uh, high risk factor or any other indication, then the quadruple marker or the integrated test that is done. And uh, usually I refer my patients to the obstetrician after that. So uh, it's only the dual marker and the NT scan what I'm prescribing to my patients. Even I don't, I just do dual marker test and we don't offer quadruple. Only if we miss dual marker, then maybe the obstetrician might be doing it. I also refer my patients after 12 weeks. Right, so, right. Because that has a higher sensitivity, as Dr. Bela said. Dr. Bela has so mentioned beautifully. No I yes. think so. This question doesn't. So, yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Garima, you can also give your inputs. Let me be very honest. Being an IVF consultant, I do the deliveries also. And I have been actually because the patients have undergone so much economic uh, stress that till now I was a little confused. Today, doctor, and I was, uh, I used to actually give quadruple markers also because the patients were not ready for the dual markers as they said that we'll wait till the end and then decide in case of IVF cases. But yes, from now on, it is going to be the dual marker all always with the, with yeah. this so happy to a... hear that. Happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bela, you join. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this yeah, was... I would like to uh, ask you one thing that yeah. in a high risk patient, instead of this, should we get an NIPT done or uh, yeah, like that was my question also. So, yeah. so NIPT is something one again. Remember two facts about NIPT. We don't if we are not uh, considering the cost because as yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll tell you. So number one. Before you advise NIPT, remember that's again a screening test only. Exactly. Go with 99% sensitivity for 21, 18, 13, but it's a screening test. And secondly, it will give information only about, I mean, the best 99% sensitivity is for trisomy 21 and around 97, 98 for trisomy 18 and 13, 13. So with so this, with this number, it, it will not give you information on high risk about any other trisomies or any other genetic syndromes. Whereas, your biochemistry double marker, quad marker gives you a lot more information about other chromosomal problems also and uh, also about the uh, pre risk calculation for preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction. Now, considering NIPT, many patients are even asking for NIPT from their side. So what is best if you want to offer is new, you can combine the combined test with NIPT. Not just nuchal scan with NIPT. You can do a, a nuchal scan, double marker and NIPT. Why? Because the uh, risk calculation for preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction, which is again very, very common even in IVF patients. Pre they are very high risk for preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction. So their offering double marker will add to the information about risk calculation for preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction about which you are much more worried than just the aneuploidy. 
right? NFT will tell you with high specificity that these three things are not there. But what about risk calculation, pre-acclimation, fetal growth restriction? So for IVF patient, if they are affording, might as well do a double marker plus an IPT. Yes, NIPT is good to rule out these three common things. But other things, even the double marker will show or the combined test will show high risk for other some of the genetic syndromes. So for affording patient, offer the best what is there for them. They are really affording, offer the best. Combined plus NIPT. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Bela, I want to ask you one more question. If like we transfer lots of low mosaic embryos also at times when we don't have euploid embryos. So how do we proceed for genetic testing in these patients once they conceive? Because See, dual marker may not be enough here. No. So basically, as I said, for any patient screening, the best screening test for any patient is Definitely a combined test because it's early in the pregnancy, 85 to 90 percent. If you find that they are at higher risk because of the quality of embryo or whatever, combine it with NIPT. So there's at least three common chromosomal problems you can rule out, but counsel the patient very well because they are spending some 10, 15, 17,000. They feel that NIPT is negative, so everything is normal. No, that counseling comes becomes very important in these patients that because you are at higher risk for aneuploidy, we are doing the highest sensitive test for aneuploidies, that is NIPT, but that will rule out three common chromosomal problems, that is 21, 18, 13. For rest all, we need to look at the nuchal scan, the markers on the scan, and the biochemistry. So for them, yes, NIPT as an addition is a good option because you are looking at a high risk. Should we do NIPT or amniocentesis? Because in low mosaic, whatever result we are getting, we are getting from the trophoblastic cells. We are not taking any biopsy from ICM. So, so in those if cases, do, amniocentesis is amniocentesis always better. Is better. Because even CVS, yes. the chances of mosaicism yeah, it will, will be higher. High. So amnio is best when you have a higher uh, chance of mosaicism. So, amniocentesis so dual marker with amniocentesis will be the... Yes, combined way. test but, is what we do initially. But still, okay. based on your embryo and all, if you have yeah. a higher chance of mosaic, then amniocentesis. amniocentesis. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? So, uh, this is my question to Dr. Sonu Balara because uh, we get so many guest speakers in our Rivadi who say that even with single follicle, we go for IVF and we get good results. So, I just want everyone to share. And Dr. Dipankar, Dr. Dipankar Banerjee, have you joined, sir? Okay. So, Dr. Sonu, tell me, will you go for IVF when you have a single follicle in a poor responder for IVF? And if yes, then... Definitely, Seema, I would go for a, a aspiration. And if it is a good mature uh, oocyte that we have retrieved, we may have a good embryo. And uh, the patient may get pregnant with that uh, embryo. And uh, I, I have many patients, like not many, we uh, selected patients who have had pregnancies and they have delivered with a single follicle. It, there was indeed my cousin, first cousin. It was six years back. I did with a single follicle. Actually, I had asked her, I said, I don't want you to spend so much money with that. She said, no, Didi, let's do with a single follicle. And she delivered a baby girl. So after that, uh, it boosted my confidence also. And uh, I never, uh, like I always offer the patient uh, what they want, but I would like them to go even with a single follicle for aspiration. So do you counsel them for donor egg before that? Or uh, it is the patient's insistence or it's your confidence that gives you the go for single uh, for a donor egg, we can go any time. If the patient can spend money, we can go for a donor egg after maybe six months or one year. But at least if we want to give the patient a genetic child of their own, we should first always try to uh, stimulate. And even if it's a single follicle, we should at least give a chance to the patient. And what is the protocol you use for that patient, particular patient, which had just a single follicle? Usually, I use the antagonist protocol, uh, maybe uh, with uh, 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 what um, like giving uh, androgens in the previous cycle and uh, giving a, quite a high dose of uh, HMG or uh, FSH. And uh, usually, I do an antagonist cycle for them. Okay, so according to you, if the dose of HMG is increased, it can help in getting a better egg. Dr. Minakshi, uh, what about uh, you? 
if we are giving okay uh, okay and you dr son you can continue yes oh, yeah kanchi will uh, we, we are doing the same thing so <laughs> maybe yeah. okay. so uh, dr seema i will decide on based on first her age if she is young i would like to go with the single follicle also but if she is old i might cancel the case i might not proceed right. further also second thing amh and afc as well sometimes we have a good amh of say around 1 but we find but only one egg grows uh, and the other follicles are not growing and on ultrasound we can see five six follicle are there but only one is growing so in those cases also i might cancel the cycle and proceed with a e2 uh, e priming and giving testosterone gel and then stimulate so we might get a better cohort next time uh, it depends basically on these factors it's not for all that we are going to proceed with single follicle but yes as dr sonu said we have had yeah. multiple patients who are younger who produce only one and we get one euploid embryo and they conceive so based on age amh and afc we should decide which way we have to go yeah. whether to proceed or whether to offer donor eggs right right very right we just wanted your opinion on individual levels that everybody is doing uh, welcome uh, dr dipankar sir and uh, dr garima welcome. what about you yeah. Uh, Ma'am, in our cases, there are two things. In uh, because once a case, we usually even go for a single uh, follicle. We do uh, carry on the procedure for a single follicle also. But once we have there, if the image is good, they as said one mid cycle, we retrieved the follicle which was the large, growing the, and then what we did was we saw the remaining of the cohort which had three four uh, follicles. It grew, and after four days, we aspirated them, and there were. good two quality embryo uh, two uh, good quality two embryos not just this the other thing that we very frequently do is to do uh, embryo pooling like in that cycle if there is only one the next cycle the cohort is majority of the times better it is usually two or three in the next cycle and the third we have even three cycle pooling times at times so these are the two things that uh, i wanted to put forth so uh, right. no, i would like to add that even if it is a uh, small follicle like uh, 10 12 or 14 mm we usually aspirate and what we found that it also gives us a mature right. oocyte uh, it's not the size of the egg like if it is only more than 16 or 17 but we usually aspirate all of them whatever uh, is there and we may get a mature uh, oocyte from the, uh, those follicles also So, uh, the Pankaj sir, final verdict from you. We were missing you. So, uh, do you always go? You you must not be getting single follicle. I'm sure your patient must be giving many many follicles. So you have no, to share. No, no, no. Why the, doesn't uh, sir get uh, poor uh, responder? <laughs> He has got the magical hands. No, so sir, tell us no, what. No, no. Uh, and what do you do? No, 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 no. No, don't, don't, don't say like this. <laughs> There is. <laughs> So sir, what we are angels are there. You tell us what do you do with single follicle? No, no. Yes. It is very clear by what I am listening that there are by positive criteria. If you go with the thirty-five years with low AMH and less than thirty-five years or less than thirty with low AMH, so less than thirty low AMH gives one or two good quality oocyte. But in positive criteria, if it is more age. the chances of getting good quality egg will be less for everyone i think this is a common thing but the thing is most of the time i am personally a non donor person so i try to do whatever it is available and even one egg even with the natural cycle also so it is up to the patient and the doctor how we communicate with each other and then we can it is the matter of the beggars are not choosers what you were get if lady is going to get get a chance with the follicle then why not and it, you can go for the consecutive double stimulation one or two even sometimes in luteal phase stimulation i got more than one egg previously in follicular phase one egg so what uh, dr gari gari ma yes pull the embryo it is a very 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 prudent thing and we do this way there is no doubt about that sir tell us something about double stimulation what are you giving what protocol sir your net protocol is, is uh, yes net is not working well because i am in some other hospital I so sir, might be yes. with my doctor right. the yes. double stimulation is nothing it is any time stimulation there is now a when you go for egg retrieval for cancer patients or fertility preservation you can start stimulation on any day the thing is you are not going to give 
एच सी जी लिस्ट फाइनल मैचुरेशन इट इज द जी एन आर एच एनालॉग वॉट वी गिव इन डबल स्टिमुलेशन वॉट आई एम डूइंग आईदर वॉट आई हैव सीन दैट द माइल्ड स्टिमुलेशन यूजली डोंट टू गिव अ गुड स्टिमुलेशन एंड ऑन डे थर्टीन फोर्टीन वेन वेन एवर वी डू द वॉलिकुलर एस्पिरेशन we start do first on on that day from twice a day so that she should not have periods and in this way you can prevent you can may not use the cetrolex in the luteal phase stimulation so there will not be any problem and we are not going to do fresh embryo transfer so in these cases we do a double stimulation and when we do gnrh analog this trigger do after 36 or 38 hours i do aspiration wait for two days same stimulation again most of the time most of the time no eggs very sincerely i am accepting that but it is a taking a desperate method desperate measure to get any eggs if the patient is willing to have consecutive stimulation no problem but if don't you don't have time that she cannot stay in my city too long then she comes for one month and we can have two stimulation and get pull the pull the embryo and then so later this is the way i am doing this with low amh patients and the second thing is there are a lot of add ons what we give nowadays but most of the time growth hormone i use not working very well so the thing is even a urinary gonadotropin with high dose one or two eggs if you get m2 side then it usually works but it depends upon how the quality of the egg whether it crosses the day 3 embryo genome activation or not if it doesn't then we stop and even tell patient that there is no embryo for you or no blastocyst thank you sir my patient did get eggs in double stimulation so next question uh okay we this time we start with dr minakshi dr minakshi we have started estrogen so till what time do you continue estrogen in your patient once for four endometrium if you started the patient on estrogen so if the patient is not on gnrh analogs then i don't give beyond 17 18 days so luteal phase you are not giving those estrogen. there are papers no i didn't. i thought it is endometrial preparation okay. no only in ivf cycle once you start estrogen say on day 3 i, I thought it is fpt cycle okay no are you talking about fresh embryo transfers so, okay do tell us about the fresh or first frozen, then frozen. Like frozen. normally which given for frozen frozen you tell us about frozen first then we talk about the fresh also frozen embryo when do you start yeah. until when you continue frozen embryo transfer will start from day 2 to prepare the endometrium till what time and till 10 weeks of pregnancy because yes. mostly it is hrt if if the frozen embryo transfer is done in hrt cycle it has to go on till 10 weeks till the placenta takes over uh, same dose if it is done use? usually i don't go beyond 6 mg so 6 mg continues i don't reduce after that because many a times patient gets bleeding breakthrough bleed, bleeding yes. if it's a natural cycle fet we don't give any estrogen till we do the embryo transfer only after embryo transfer i i usually give 4 mg estrogen more than that is generally not needed and once she is pregnant and she reaches around 8 weeks i even reduce that or even stop it at times because it is a natural cycle and corpus luteum is also producing some estrogen in right. hrt cycle we can, we have to give it till 10 uh, weeks because till the placenta starts functioning and starts producing estrogen so you mean if it's a poor endometrium in a fresh cycle you will just freeze the embryo if it's a poor transfer. endometrium yeah i will not transfer not transfer and I not take the steps also yeah not adjuvants uh, dr say also we will refer from dr minakshi it's it same uh about uh, frozen embryo transfers you are saying or uh, fresh yeah so do you uh, differ from dr minakshi your take for our audience regarding what uh, like i would estrogen support in patient i will let's talk about the uh, frozen, frozen embryos, embryos. Dr. Dr. i agree with uh, dr minakshi 
so uh, day 2 or day 3 uh, usually 6 mg uh, i'm giving and uh, i also don't give beyond 15 14 15 days because what the studies are saying like you give till 28 or 36 days but i have seen that it hardly grows if we are giving it for a longer period of very time. poor results also and it is not giving a good uh, result also so mm, uh, i also just uh, give till 14 15 days and uh, six or maybe if it is a thin endometrium maybe uh, i add another uh, like transdermal uh, also uh, to the uh, oral estrogen i usually use the oral estrogens uh, for that uh, the pankar sir uh, what will you recommend like we come across so many patients who have persistently 4 mm endometrium we keep on giving estrogen now the literature says up to 6 weeks also you can give but we feel you know beyond 22 days 21 days if you are continuing estrogen the cycle is gone patient will neither conceive no you will have any other result also and the cost is also increasing so sir what is your take on that this happens i think with everyone the uh, the development of the endometrium is not good what i add is a cute estradiol gel also tds 2 mg i think there is a one major over there and with 2 mg bd estradiol valerate and then if it is not going well ab above five then add twice a day estradiol gel it might work there are people or i am also doing sometimes prp infusion also under ultrasound guide but most of the time it doesn't give two very very good result but if you read genong or any physiology book what i have found that if you read gaitan or genong they have written that on the day of hlh surge it is 5.2 mm is the natural endometrium so we are having a limit of 7 mm by one ganon paper in 1989 but what i feel that if it is three layer above 5 5.2 5.3 5 it is not going above after 14 15 days i think you should go for embryo transfer because this this endometrium is not going to improve second tell that when we start estrogen for frozen embryo transfer i always do most of the i think all learned panelist must be using doing second day serum whenever it is more Uh, so your voice Don't is breaking. You have, to, you have to repeat And your sentence, sir. Day two. Hello. Yes, sir. Now audible. On, yeah. Day two. Day two. Hello. Yes, sir. On day two, whenever we go for frozen embryo transfer, what I in my routine practice. Seema, I would like to add till sir's connection is again. Uh, uh, like in persistently thin endometrium, I have had a patient, uh, two three patients, even at four millimeters, I have transferred, and that patient had delivered. Uh, she got pregnant, and she's got two children. Uh, with a persistently like it was four, not even four, uh, the endometrium. So even the patient was tired, and I was tired. I said, she said, okay, ma'am, you just uh, transfer. and but uh, she had placenta accreta and bleeding uh, uh, like at around uh, 36 37 weeks when uh, she had delivered so this okay. makes a complication with that but still yeah, the thin yes, and we can transfer uh, in those patients also great yes sir hello what i do on, on day to do a serum progesterone because if it is more than 1 right. nanogram per ml so it is not better that you should not do fet awesome. yes. and on the day when you is going to for i always do serum progesterone i want to uh, fet if you go the what the spanish people do for era testing that era testing is for endometrial they have given <laughs> strict protocol that it is should be less than 1 at the start and it should be less than 1 when you start progesterone 
and this is very chances of getting pregnancy will be little bit less and the madam uh, sonu dr sonu is absolutely correct whenever there is a pregnancy with low endometrium poor endometrium very we true. have to be very careful about that placental problem and there are but what i want to share that madam i don't know i will be your 60 cases very few cases with pregnancy induced hypertension and pregnancy this placental problem these problems they start at the time of implantation and whenever there is a first uh, this invasion there is problem with the placentation if the placentation problem is reduced then getting a good pregnancy later on at the third trimester is most of the time it is very good so i am coming with the data and abhi koi likhne wala mil nahi raha karke it is not possible otherwise i have a data nahi mam i am not joking but matlab write my name in your paper i will write for you no problem i would like to ask you do the serum so ye jo are you doing serum me too also sir dr sonu is asking i am like sir was saying on day 2 he is doing the estrogen levels so is it not progesterone is it progesterone is not estrogen i i heard because the connection is poor connectivity problem yes and the thing is if there is poor endometrium jaise main when i start gel and all main ek bar serum estradiol bhi kara leta hu ab it is more than picogram par ml se bhi upar chal raha hai aur endometrium theek nahi ho raha that means there is a problem in endometrium because serum level is good so it is that if my liver ka pass kar do bypass karke yadi subcute de ke systemic mein jaye then it might help because whenever the estradiol valinate is being taken it through goes through liver and there is serum level might go down but if it serum level is very high and endometrium is not growing then there is a problem of in the endometrium and second thing whenever i do an ultrasound i don't believe too much on this doppler and all because you can manage the doppler also but if it is good three line more than five main nahi rukta i go for embryo transfer if it is less than less than 1 nanogram per ml progesterone thank uh, you sir so, so you have a question is like uh, uh, if we change the uh, like if we change from estrogen valerate to uh, hemihydrate does does it affect the level of the endometrium mm -hmm. I At don't have that the, idea because serum levels, I, serum levels will be better with hemihydrate. So sometimes asa. when uh, valerate doesn't work, hemihydrate works. Might work. I have used it as a liver bypass. I have used uh, and it works. I will try that. I have never used that. So, so I, I also change if uh, valerate is not uh, working. Maybe yes. giving a hemihydrate. Because you, when you go to fertility, sterility, or usme jayenge, so. ये जो ये जो वेलरेट और हेमीहाइड्रेट का जो बहुत ज्यादा लिटरेचर मेरे को मिला नहीं क्योंकि द थिंग्स द कंपनी इज कमिंग विद बहुत ज्यादा कन्विंसिंग नहीं लगा दैट्स व्हाई आई स्टिल गो फॉर दिस गुड ब्रांड स्टडी ऑल जो भी दैट इज फ्रॉम एनी गुड कंपनी इंटरनेशनल जो आई जस्ट वांटेड टू नो स्टीम फैकल्टी के देयर्स देयर्स अनदर थिंग कमिंग अप एंड वी हैव Once, but it was of no result. The GnRH agonist is given from the second day with estrogen, so that and this cycle can be continued up to twenty-eight to thirty days. But mm -hmm. the lining actually did not. I mean, to be honest, I did try it twice, but the lining actually did not come beyond five five point five in the patient who had responded poor so much. Um, so, is, do you find that um, um, good? In, have, has anybody of you tried, or do you? I have never tried. I have no. <laughs> Fine. Actually, hey, Doctor Garima, I didn't get you. GnRH agonist is started from day two. Yeah, without the, giving before. Yeah, day two. We give it along with estrogen in frozen embryo transfer cycles. It can be given, it is, but that will yeah. cause a flare effect. No, why are we giving it? We, were, we don't want follicle to form. No, we were giving the day. We were starting it from the twenty uh, first day of the cycle. That was one milligram, and from day two we did point five. and we um, added estrogen to it for the frozen embryos but to suppress Maybe the there is there is there, there is protocol because what you are doing you are down regulating the patient and there you will be free of 
getting higher progesterone uh, before starting the progesterone this is the one way definitely no problem but the kya hota hai ki convenience aur dusra cost that also matters and the thing is what i have seen i was doing whatever what you are telling um kai bar we do a uh, lupride depo also on the day 14 of the yeah. day cycle cycle yeah. so so you can you can have all throughout the month with the down regulated patient you can to kai bar aisa bhi hota hai sometimes those polycystic ovarian disease jisme humko frozen embryo transfer karna hota hai because they don't have regular periods to unka day two kab aayega then i start an ocp on day 14 i put a lipoid depo and when they come on after finishing the, the withdrawal period on second or third day or fourth day i do a serum progesterone most of the time it is less so we are free from anything that uh, the chances will be better so this is a uh, definitely a very good protocol no doubt about that so this question i will uh, But, give to dr garima because i think we will have to finish in another 10 minutes and we are left with six questions so one of uh, the panelists will answer and so will give the final verdict so dr garima what what will you do in poor responders and uh, till which day of menses you will wait for transfer so let us make our answers little brief what we are actually doing in practice so that everybody takes yeah. the message yeah Day of estrogen stimulation, we usually in those cases do it up to 18 days. So last day of transfer would be about 21 to 22 days. That's it. That's what we do in our practice. In the normal cycles, the transfers, the frozen embryo cycle transfers, we don't do the fresh transfers. We rarely do the fresh transfers. It's free for all, and you do till what date? You say 21st, 23rd day. That, that is, is maximum. That that's I think that's standard. Ah, uh, sir, the Pankaj sir is there. Okay, I think that's standard. We can take next question. Next question, Dr. Minakshi will answer, and then Dr. Sonu. Next question, uh, Dr. Minakshi. Yes. Any side effects of long-term estrogen? Liver damage. Yes. ALT and enzymes will get raised, and uh, sometimes they get uh, this hepatitis as well with that. And, so we uh, should be very careful. And heart problems also, and uh, thrombotic episodes also. One of my patient had severe convulsions following long-term estrogen. The Pankaj sir, I had asked a question from Dr. Garima that how long uh, you can continue estrogen and transfer in a patient of uh, frozen cycle. So her answer was that uh, 22. जो estrogen का मेरा जो maximum is 17 to 18 days उसके बाद नहीं दिया मैं. I think that because uh, too too. Too long estrogen will not work if it is not working. Better to get a withdrawal period and then do start with the fresh. Yes, Otherwise, yes. Uh, usually it doesn't work. But one thing I have noticed, I noticed one thing that if it is, it should be more than ten to eleven days at least because it has been given in some papers that at least twelve to thirteen days of the project estrogen priming gives better result. And it is days. my personal experience. Minimum ten days. Literature minimum ten, minimum 10, 10 days. Any day, any yeah. time. Okay, and uh, next question to Dr. Sonu. Question number six: Proge Role of progesterone in poor endometrium, Dr. Sonu. Yes, maybe the blood flow may increase, and uh, there may be a little bit benefit of uh, when after, even if it is a thin endometrium, it may benefit like uh, till the time we are doing a transfer, uh, embryo transfer. Right, very right. So, sir, uh, I think we all agree that progesterone does have a role, sir. Uh, just brief two-liner for the. Attendees and all of us. Progesterone for what? Uh, in poor endometrium, is it there is any specific role like we are giving progesterone to every patient like one size fitting all? Uh, do you recommend that in poor endometrium there is some specific progesterone that should be given or specific time it should no. be started? Progesterone to be given when progesterone you cannot give while doing the luteal phase only. Yeah. It is so, you. How can you how can you change the window of implantation? Then there will be problem. Right, sir. So, so it, it is standard, better. What yes, standard protocol. If HRT, you have to give. Otherwise, desensitization will not happen. If it's right, a right. fresh transfer again, you would have aspirated some granulosa cell. It will be you. You will have to add. Yes. In in fresh in fresh cycle. Fresh cycle. Fresh so cycle. I think yes. corpus luteum will be there. It will be supporting. So even without progesterone, also you can do, sir. What do you say? In 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 fresh in fresh in cycle, cycle, if you supposing we do... are aspirating six uh, follicles, all of them will uh -huh. form six corpus luteum, and they will be giving progesterone. Is, so is it a must? Like we give, but I'm just asking you. No, no, no. Whenever you aspirate granular granular cells from the granular follicle, you are you are reducing the load of granular cells, which is luteinized cell. You have to support the cycle with the progesterone. 
either you give by with the help of hcg by yes. leukotrophic or by simple progesterone so what both, is better sir hcg or progesterone both are good both? i do both are good hcg is very good but hcg should be given 5 days prior to doing pregnancy test because it might interfere maine ye dekh liya i have seen that 5 days ka interval is okay patient gets happy so sir are you giving it routinely to <laughs> all your patients progesterone and hcg to all your i was laughing at you <laughs> I give HCG most of the patient in fresh cycle. No Ash, doubt about that. What But is the dose you are giving weekly? Two hundred, two thousand international unit every fourth, every third day, every fourth right. day. Right. And there should be every there should be five day gap of the last injection and pregnancy test beta HCG. If okay. patient is negative, it is negative less than two. It doesn't right. interfere with the serum level. Next question to Dr. Garima. So persistent persistent calcified endometrium any treatment? I am a voucher for hysteroscopy. I go in for a hysteroscopy and hysteroscopic uh, removal of the calcium with, oh, yes. and then uh, we uh, start with the HRT treatment in the second. And That's it right. works, sir. Have anybody? My there is one question from my side. I have uh, Seema. You must be also seeing in some group that interseed being used during in hysteroscopy. Inter, yeah. inter ma'am. We are not using. Right. I think nowadays, sir, in the latest groups on videos and all, uh, people have been saying that they use when uh, septal resection or something has been done. I was. Uh -huh. I was. Uh -huh. no, I have no uh, experience. Or, yeah, we have joined recently, Doctor Alka Kriplani's group, and uh, there we get lots of discussion on all these things. But uh, we are still not. doing it and a little away from this maybe in future discussion we will start discussing and start doing so ma'am we are i was initially putting iucds post hysteroscopy but now i have the clean cut uh, cut off a septum now we do not put anything but for the yes so, uh, but that i feel so we should not be putting right. anything after resection if it is a good resection and very ma'am asking one question Yes, sir. That are you using electricity for cutting or no. you using simple scissors, scissors as far as possible, sir? Scissors. Point that I have now totally stopped using electricity for the fibroids that are submucosal. We go laparoscopically, remove it through the laparoscope, and never use electricity in the. That right, is a very right. It damages a lots of damages done definitely. Yes, we go laparoscopically for the submucosal fibroids and for the sub septum resection. We even if we have to go twice, we do it with scissors only. Scissors only. बट वो जो रिसेक्टोस्कोप वाला इंस्ट्रूमेंट अब कम यूज होता है नहीं हां सीजर बस सर सीजर होता तो है सर कम तो नहीं होता होता तो है नहीं नहीं व्हाट आई एम आस्किंग व्हाई आई एम आस्किंग बिकॉज़ यू आर कटिंग सेप्टम और यू आर कटिंग साइनेकी सो इफ यू डू यूज ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिसिटी देन देयर विल बी मोर स्कारिंग मोर डिपेंड्स ऑन द केस और हाउ थिक द सेप्टम इज कैन यू कट इट विद द सीजर्स सो यू हैव टू डू इट Suggest that somebody does a study now. I don't know. I should do it, but then I'm working that somebody does a study that we go through the uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, to remove the submucosal fibroids rather than because with the burn burn issue happening, IVF success rate fails. It does. Fails. Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Good message. So <laughs> next question is to Dr. Minakshi. Uh, does change of stimulation protocol help improving endometrium? Over Dr. Ila talked that it does help agonist and antagonist protocol together. Even endometrium. I wanted to comment earlier also about yeah, it. Tell, Whenever tell. we encounter about thin endometrium, say in HRT cycle, we must change the protocol and see. We must monitor her in the natural cycle and see how actually thickness, what thickness of endometrium she achieves, and then accordingly decide whether to transfer in HRT or natural cycle. Not just by one cycle. If you are giving HRT and endometrium doesn't grow, we shouldn't label her as a thin endometrium. Check after one or two cycles, it might come back to normal. In so, and la, until she has any damage to the endometrium. So what will be your suggestion? Like supposing my patient is on HMG and agonist protocol and poor endometrium. So what should I shift up my patient to? What protocol? I will first of all. I, I will not transfer a fresh. I am leaving. Sima. I am yes. leaving. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Sir, 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 two more questions. Okay, sir, just take more questions. We can discuss. Ajay, Next question to Minakshi. Okay. Please continue. Yeah, we agree with Dr. Minakshi. So this question is to Dr. Sonu. Role of androgen in low MH. Should patient get pregnant? 
if uh, we are continuing androgens and patient is conceived so what will be the effect oh, of uh, dr seema i didn't get the question we are continuing the androgens for See, we were saying that for good eggs androgen have two promising this is just a vague question actually so patient is patient is already conceived and she is taking some supplements at dhas or some androgen supplement uh, so sir you can answer this question for us are there any side effects on the baby if patient is on androgen and she conceives i don't have any idea about that but the, if you are using testosterone gel better to stop at the time of uh, this uh, ovum pick up because it is of no use of using testosterone gel later on because oh, you prime I, the progesterone. no no sir my you, like this is not i think cycle just i'm saying spontaneous pregnancy she is saying spontaneous because uh, three yes, or four yes. of my patients have conceived by taking dhas and then they suddenly come to me and then then i really feel once like i should not have started or i should have stopped in time so are there any side effects reported dr sonu that dhas dhas is a very 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 low androgen Mild. potential Mild. so don't worry dhas and it is all or none phenomena Once because it no, because it crosses placenta and there is a placental sulfitase action on DHEA so it change हो जाता है उसमें मतलब वो delta five delta four पाते से जाके that becomes uh, not a very significant so, that, I think, sir. so we just take the last question and everybody can answer then uh, this is like uh, will you recommend for all IVF patients with poor endometrium okay not for routine patients do you recommend for routine patients also for, uh, for frozen term in frozen cycle we are doing for all patients no trying natural endometrium if it's a poor, poor risk, sometimes we try for the natural cycle also for two three cycles we see we only try to make it no, but, but the, my question is just that even, like uh, frozen no, not even for poor responders for any patient we can try who is uh, ovulating uh, who has a regular cycle maybe we can do a natural cycle and it's not uh, uh, for all patients that we give estrogen dr minakshi Like frozen embryos, are you giving estrogen to all the patients? If Or it's you... HRT cycle, yes, I will give. If it's a natural cycle, then and the estrogen levels were good at the time of egg rupture, progesterone rise was good. I might not add estrogen or uh, after the transfer because natural estrogen might be enough. But sir, it all depends on on the previous values. Okay, sir, sir, do we give uh, estrogen to all the patients who are going frozen embryo transfer? Because we give to all the patients in frozen cycle, regardless of their endometrial thickness or whatever status. So just wanted to confirm from others what they are doing. No, in frozen embryo transfer, priming with the estrogen and then start progesterone and continue yeah. with the estrogen little bit higher dose. That so is the normal dose. Yeah, that's what we were doing. So I just wanted to know if any of the panelists is differing. No, so in a natural cycle, I I don't start. I a... I have some word for natural cycle. I, I, natural cycle monitoring is very difficult, and uh, I don't know how to monitor that image. This LH surge, and we are I did it with ultrasound guide only. But sometimes it is very difficult to monitor a natural cycle. That's why most of the time we do an HRT. That's why it gives a better better hold on your. That no, cycle. but so if we are doing a like modified natural cycle, if you have a follicle and you give HCG and you time it according to, uh, like the day of the embryo uh, frozen embryo. No, madam, yeah. the madam, the the day of HCG when you are giving that is the crucial point because when to give HCG, are you going with LH surge and added added with the natural LH surge and HCG, or you give HCG without monitoring LH surge? If you give pre pre LH HCG before LH sir, there will be problem because this unition, this uh, time timing of the HCG start or giving the final dose, it is same like and doing an IUI because if you are giving HCG by looking at the follicular size, then Six to seven percent of the cases there might be because we are stimulating the cycle and in natural cycle it might not happen, but either she should do a daily LH monitoring by urine. What I give them LH card, so it helps to give a pinpointing the when to give the HCG or when she is ovulating. It is very simple and she can do in her home. Yeah, we are doing it with a serum yeah. LH, so uh, I usually don't get it done uh, when I'm doing a modified. Maybe I give a trigger and then I transfer accordingly. 
so i i have had uh, not had much problem so but uh, a natural cycle is a total natural cycle where we are doing the serum uh, monitoring of the hormones can i comment here for this natural cycle monitoring actually rather than checking the serum lh we should be monitoring more on the progesterone yes, sometimes exactly. without lh surge also progesterone can rise and we are worried about decidualization we are not worried about egg rupture here so it should be and this urinary kit lh kit what we get they are not able to detect actually lh surge they are not so uh, you know promising so it has to be by serum and by ultrasound more we can check when the follicle has reached 17 18 mm and after that it is only by serum progesterone we have to decide when the ovulation ha might have occurred or when the decidualization has started and then count 120 hours for the embryo transfer by just by lh surge we cannot do natural cycle and yes exactly. as you said sir natural cycle monitoring is tedious patient has to come more frequently but yeah uh, but afterwards the ch uh, chances of high uh, this iugr and high blood pressure all those complications are much less so that advantage they have that even pregnancy pregnancy is very less with natural cycle uh... yes. right right so, so that's I why we that's why we stopped natural cycle because it is more convenient for us to do an hrt and control over it and right. monitor the progesterone before starting monitor the progesterone before starting progesterone if but it sir, is okay we are doing actually the reverse we have started doing more of natural cycle rather than okay. <laughs> <laughs> take home is again you decide on your which but uh, yeah. like what is being followed till now is that we go on hrt start estrogen support with progesterone and here we end with our questions we have some questions from audience dr akriti are you ready with the questions one or two so you can just answer in one or two lines dr akriti are you there नमस्कार on 29th of october i have sent this invitation to dr seema please communicate with everyone and i call from my core of heart invite you all please come to jabalpur very nice place aapko please seema inko aap thoda sa program bata dijiye aaj badi chalenge sir aur mera birthday hai aur dr sonu ka birthday bhi celebrate kar lenge sir because we share it so dr alka over to you yes thank you everybody for wonderful sir sure, sir us cheez ko consider karte hain but it was a very nice talk from you अभी तो मैं पैनल में आई वाज सो एंग्रॉस मैं अपना वीडियो ऑफ करके आई वाज जस्ट लिसनिंग टू ईच एंड एवरीबॉडी सच ए नाइस थिंग एंड रियली इट हैज बीन वेरी नाइस अ बहुत अच्छा वाला जो है ये वेबिनार रहा आई लाइक टू थैंक द स्पीकर्स डॉक्टर ईला डॉक्टर बेला डॉक्टर सीमा एंड स्पेशली ऑल द पैनलिस्ट डॉक्टर दीपांकर यू डॉक्टर सोनू डॉक्टर मीनाक्षी डॉक्टर गरिमा ऑल ऑल हैव बीन वेरी नाइस मतलब इट वॉज सो नाइस मतलब बिल्कुल ऐसा इंग्रॉस हो गया सुन रही थी मैं कब बाकी लोगों का क्या हाल हो रहा होगा एंड एज थैंक्स टू ऑल द चेयरपर्सन डॉक्टर शहनाज डॉक्टर अनिता कान डॉक्टर दीपा डॉक्टर नंदिनी डॉक्टर आकृति बट आई थिंक इज हमारी अनुभूति सेक्रेटरी ऑफ आर सोसाइटी शी कुड मेक इट एक्चुअली कुछ प्रॉब्लम ही चल रही है सो शी वॉज नॉट देयर एंड वेरी स्पेशल थैंक्स टू डॉक्टर सीमा शी इज ऑर्गेनाइज इट एंड and uh, and as a thanks to dr deepika aap pura pura jasmin bal ki taraf se pura wo lete ho <laughs> deepika thank you very much for conducting this beautiful webinar yeah we so thank, thank you so much, much everyone yeah, thank so you dr alka dr sonu dr minakshi dr garima it was nice meeting you thank you sir Everybody just thanks. before we close i'd like to just uh, mention our natural microns progesterones available the whole range diva jest then we have endonorm ev2 that's our estradiol valerate tablet and cecilia m that's minestrol and dicarinestrol 40 is to 1 the ideal ratio the right combination to restore the reproductive health so thank you all so very much from jackson park the progestin people having so many progesterones divatron our digestron maintain our 17 hpc injections then lalestronol tablets as maintain tablets the range of divajest micronized progesterone cyclorex cr10 and plain cyclorex 
tablet for uh, norethistron and then we have dinogest endorex so thank you all so very much and thanks a lot to dr seema thank you so much